we can still talk and we can still do things, but we can't vote on it. We need seven. Too short. Thanks. Okay, everyone, I'd like to begin at 5.30, and uh, <clears throat> we don't have a quorum uh, present, as you can see. We need, uh, what's the man? Seven. Two more? Okay. We have five. We need seven. So um, that just means, for those of you who are present, that we can't take any official action as a commission tonight, but we can go over our agenda, and we can continue with any comments or any remarks that people have, and we will do that. So starting with the agenda review, I'd like to ask Carter Rowley to uh, take us through uh, tonight's docket. Tonight, you will be uh, looking at the mental health crisis response policy. That was something that you had asked for at your retreat last May. Uh, Chief will provide a presentation. It includes two months' worth, because as you recall, we didn't have one last month. A uh, discussion about closed circuit television, and there is a draft uh, policy that is really draft just for your discussion about downtown closed circuit TV use. And follow up with a conversation about what, if anything, additionally you want to do about constitutional privacy. The packet includes a summary of the comments that you provided at the last meeting. Uh, and then uh, finally, an update on the police commission vacancy. I apologize, I've got the paper here. It wasn't ready in time for the packet, so I'll hand that out when we get there. And that's it. Thank you, Carter. Okay, the next uh, item on our agenda is a public comments, and I'd like to turn the meeting over this time to our vice chair, Tamara Moore, so she can conduct that. Thank you. I have two members of the public signed up to speak today. The first is Carol Kerr Caldwell. Carol, welcome to the table and. You can have your cho your choice of seats today. <laughs> and, Hi, Carol. And you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Caldwell, 2510 Augusta. Greetings. In case you missed the in-depth September 28th RG, and as it turns out, same day in the New York Times article about police recording devices nationwide, I brought my dog-eared copy if you wish to peruse during break. I think you'll feel similarly proud and impressed as I did, for it's patently clear that EPD has been so ahead of the curve, even ahead of NYPD, who has yet to assign body cams. EPD initiated this nearly two years ago says a lot. EPD officer Bremer may well have played a key role in this. He purchased his own body cam as a downtown bike officer to capture interactions with subjects for their protection and likely to also document his own ethical conduct. Smart. Forward thinking of EPD management since then to provide body cams to all downtown cops and some patrol officers, repair allegedly malfunctioning ICVs, install ever more new ICVs. It just doesn't get any better than this. I hope that other local law enforcement agencies who lack sufficient or any cameras soon will have these tools. It's no reflection on these agencies for this lack, for the, these cameras aren't cheap. Not having cameras, however, may prove far more costly in several ways, so I hope they get these tools soon. Also, each of you received scanned copies of a two-page document I provided Carter recently pertinent to EPD policies, practices, procedures surrounding towing, impound, release fees. Costs incurred by motorists for committing a variety of violations and crimes, i.e. Dewey's, no Oregon license or insurance, unsafe vehicle, results in costly tow impound release fees. I understand and respect the reason need to have vehicles impounded. I understand that local law enforcement agencies' impound policies from various departments are somewhat similar to EPD's, but also a bit across the map. I refer to two matters I observed recently at court, the juxtaposition of a Caucasian Dewey arrestee being allowed to avoid impound costs by contacting a driver to get his car home. A Latino driver cited for no Oregon license had his car impounded. However, I know that some cited arrested Latino members were given that option to call in a licensed driver to take the car away. I also know Caucasian drivers have had cars impounded, perhaps no option to call for drivers. Again, all over the map, it's that officer discretion thing, 
premise I recognize is needful, for situations do vary. I suggest this body consider reviewing EPD policies and procedures regarding towing impound, not from any supposition that anything's wrong, but maybe this body could see other areas of possible improvements. You've taken up the task of addressing racial profiling community concerns. This might be another related area to study and offer input. For example, do all police vehicles have that computerized language line that helps facilitate those call-ins to a licensed friend option, thus reducing costly impacts of towing an impound? I'm just asking, and you might want to look into it too. Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you. Next, they have Majeska C. Spring. Hi. Hello. Um, I'll be short. Um, um, this is uh, about the professional police contacts policy, which I understand isn't finalized yet within the police department. But um, I know the police commission's finished its work on that, so I'll address my comments to the chief and other EPD people here. Um, and this is just a comment from, uh, I'd say, from a community perspective. And basically, it's just about the title of it. I, I, I really think that the title should include the word profiling or bias, one or the other of those two words. Um, I, I think that with a, a title like professional police context, I understand that you wanted the titles to be positive about what you want in policing rather than what you don't want. But it seems to me that in this case, maybe an exception should be made because um, like if, if a member of the public was, was looking through the table of contents of the, the um, policies, looking for something on the subject of bias or profiling, they're not likely to realize that professional police contacts is about that. There's so many other aspects of being a professional police officer in the context. So I, I just think that it, without having it a little more evident what the policy is about in the title, it almost comes across like maybe looks like maybe trying to whitewash the situation or something. So I just think in this case it, it would be more valuable to um, somehow include profiling or bias in the title. Thanks. Thank you. If there are no other members of the public present who wish to speak, that concludes our public forum. Bob, I'd like to turn the back over to you. Thank you. And uh, of course, the next on the agenda is a response by commissioners, and feel free to respond to any comments or any remarks you might have yourself that could add to the conversation. Who would like to start? I volunteer. I will. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Um, I mentioned what Majeska said before I agree as you're as you're scrolling through the police policies and there are many of them to scroll through um, it'd be nice if the title of this one was more informative about what was in it and that reminded me of I've been over a couple of days this week tried printing policies from the website and they come up in a special viewer and there's a button to print them as PDF and it hasn't been working at least on my computer I don't know okay it hasn't been working for three years ah. hmm. and the answer from IT is that it won't it's it inconsistent work. with our <coughs> software is inconsistent with the button that says printing it's a police application problem that they have not um, determined if or how to fix so you can read it just fine online, and it looks just like the format that we have, but there's no way to commit that to paper. Can you, can you do a save as and then print it? Mm -hmm. you know? Can you copy it? I used it in the Word. No, because it's inside a, a kind of a picture. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, that's not good. You can. You can, but then it's page after, you oh. know, you're pulling up yeah. sections. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I suppose I, I can go. Um, yeah, I don't don't really have much um, uh, to talk about. Just uh, comments. Unfortunately, there was a train going through, so I sat there for a while. Um, so 
I'll save it for the end. Well, thanks for getting here. As you can see, we're one short of the so Yeah, I, I just noticed that. Everybody can do a little bit else. <laughs> Else? I mean, we don't have to respond. It's just this is an opportunity to respond. Don't feel you have to. Um, so, a couple of things. One is um, I appreciate uh, Carolyn bringing up that article about um, uh, body worn cameras that appeared in the register card. That was a good article. And every time I hear about something happening around the country, in particular in Ferguson, Missouri, and they just had another incident, I think to myself, I wonder how this would have turned out differently if that department had either in-car video or body-worn cameras um, as far as the controversy and the um, height or perceived um, outcome or activities that occurred in um, those incidents. And I think that just having that, that piece of equipment um, or p pieces of equipment to tell the story and show what actually happened in those circumstances would um, actually go a long way. So I really commend the Eugene Police Department and Chief Kearns for being so proactive in, um, in having those devices and, and trying to um, get those more of that equipment to, out to the department and the officers. Um, other thing is on September 30th, I was able to participate in the U of O community welcome where we went in a group of community leaders and um, members and U of O students went around and uh, welcomed U of O students and handed out their, one of the things we handed out was their, I think it's called Red Cup, what was that called? Red Cup um, brochure, it looked like a red solo cup and it told um, students how to party responsibly. And a lot of them were really, I mean most of them were really receptive to the information and wanted to have it and seemed excited that people were there to welcome them. I got to um, go around with a, a U of O student from the, um, Alternative Dispute Resolution Center. I don't think that's the correct title, but um, he uh, works in the um, in that capacity, and he's also a student. So that was great. Um, uh, you know, the this is the police commission. They're going to talk about that policy. That's why we're here. Come on in. Thank you. You have to sit in one of these chairs. Um, so it was really a great opportunity to be able to participate in that. And as far as um, Majeska's comments about the title of the um, policy. I appreciate, always appreciate members of the public coming in and speaking up and, um, and giving their thoughts on that. For me, I always have to think of those things and try to remember that the, the police operations manual was mainly for the police department. And so if, if the police officers who use that as a tool mm -hmm. and the department who use that as a tool are able to locate those policies and that's the main purpose of the manual it's great when the public has access to it and or can print it but um you know it's not the main purpose is not for the public it's for the department so that's my thoughts on that thank you anyone else have anything that they'd like to uh... just a, the body cams it really helps and uh in car video really, really helps the citizen review and I wish it was available at each and every time. It's just so marvelous for stopping opinions and you can look at it and form your own opinion instead of getting somebody else's opinion. So it's, I think, a very good idea. Thank you, George. And while we're uh, talking, we're talking about that, it reminded me that, uh, to remind you that we have a joint meeting Tuesday with the Civilian Review Board. And of course, Monday night is a presentation to the council and Tim and I will be there to present mm -hmm. um, our work plan and to tell them what we've accomplished this year at 5.30 at City Council in Harris Hall. And it, uh, the meeting Tuesday is at the library. At the right? library, yes. Right. And it's at 5 o'clock. 5 to 8? Is it 5? Oh. I don't I have it on my think so. Really? Well, Let me double I think check. There's food at five. There's oh, food at five, and see. then we have a social hour of drinks, I, I and see. you know, from okay. the <laughs> you guys are under a different budget. Yeah. Right. Okay. All yes. right. So just reminding the commissioners of that, and anyone else who would be interested in attending. So um, five, six, thank you. Did you have something else you wanted to add? Yeah. Uh, I guess the um, body worn camera stuff is not on the agenda this uh, this time, and so I did. I had requested the you know. Uh, a link to um, the cameras that the department was considering and unfortunately didn't get that. 
But I did spend some time looking at some of these cameras, and unfortunately, I was not particularly impressed. I mean, one of the big problems is that a lot of them are using the older style lithium batteries that are good for about 300 cycles. And the cases are uh, ultrasonically welded, so you cannot replace the battery, which means that some of these units will have to be replaced annually because you'll consume 300 cycles over the course of a year. So it represents a, you know, an ongoing expense. There were some others that looked a little more, more promising. Um, but I kind of took the cue that the one he was interested in was the taser unit, um, which I guess had a 130 uh, degree view and $400 price. Um, so I figured that was the one he was talking about. But that one does suffer from that problem. And there, are, there were some other cameras that looked uh, a little bit more interesting. But, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, didn't really see anything that I, you know, if I was part of the police department looking for this, that I would be particularly excited about. I didn't think anything was a particularly good deal. But that's my two cents on that one. Thank you. And Carter, I believe you have something you'd like to I just wanted to say the department forwarded me the link, and oh. I missed it at the bottom of an email. It's in, my, it's in the queue ready for tomorrow. Oh, okay. So the link to the specs is, I didn't know there was a deadline. Had there, anyway, it's going out tomorrow. Okay. And we appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so um, no one else oh, okay. comment? Quick. Yeah, um, go ahead. As normal as Tamara did too, and thank you for commenting. It's always great to hear comments from the, from the public. Um, I know nobody's talked about um, the impound policy. I don't think yet that uh, that Carol brought up. So I thought I'd comment on that a little bit. I, I think it might. I haven't read the policy, so I'm not sure what's in there. But I I think it maybe having a recommendation that if possible, if somebody can be contacted to drive the car home, other than the person obviously that's been been stopped might be good now that I know that can't happen in all circumstances because you might get called away and you're not going to want that person to and you may you know who knows what the circumstances are but if if at all possible if that can be done I think that would be a, a great way to have uh, some good positive public um, public face and um, probably reduce a lot of uh, anxiety for a lot of drivers and having to get that out and understand what's going on. And good to see everybody again. And it looks like we, I think we have a quorum now. Thank you. Welcome, Bill. We're in the commissioner's comments. If you had something pressing, you'd like to bring No, up. I just apologize for being late. That's fine. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, minutes approval. Carter uh, provided you with a copy. Uh, please let me know if there's any corrections or changes to the minutes. If not, I'll take a motion to approve them as presented. Well, so moved. Joe? Second. Second by Jesse. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the mental health uh, crisis response review. And, um, we have policy in our pack, and we'll ask Matt to join us at the table now so he can answer any questions you might have regarding the policy. Mm -hmm. Would you like to pre present uh, the policy, or do you want to let it speak for itself? Well, I, I, yeah, I don't, you don't need me running, running okay. off and reading things over to you again. I, I'm happy to just answer any questions. I'm sure you all read it, all right. read it ahead of time. So. Questions, concerns from the commissioners? I'll get a cue going here. Do you have any? Okay. And I, I was part of, on the police commission when the um, commission worked on this policy. I think it, it was done through a committee that I was not a member of, but I mean, I reread it, and I, I, I do think it's a very well-written policy. Um, I, it is a little long. I just um, am always a big fan of brevity and succinctness in written materials. I don't have any suggestions for where it could be um, revised to cut down the length, but just a general comment if there was a way to 
make it shorter. It might be, maybe it needs to be this long. So just a bit of a read. Yeah. Uh, th this is a, uh, there, there are two severely underrepresented groups or groups that are advocated admirably but still we can't cover the need and that's people with mental health problems and children in Lane County. And I, I don't think it's unique to Lane County, I think it's just unique to law enforcement and society. Um, so I agree with you to stop brevity. Um, I also agree that this is uh, material that's of genuine interest to the community not on a day-to-day -day basis but when it's and when it's the in kind of the worst case scenario you know there, there's a there's an, a you know a, a use of force against somebody with mental health and um, somebody in a mental health crisis and uh, that's a very it, it, it's it's a very uh, it's not divisive but it's, it's, it's a hot button issue for people there, there are people that think um, police should have more training on dealing with people with mental health and I think in part some of this level of detail is our best effort to provide that to the community that we're, you know, we take these events very seriously. There, you know, as, as, a, as a police officer, there's certain parts of this policy that are, that are very helpful and very important, you know, particularly the recognizing abnormal behaviors and determining danger. Because uh, that's not just for me, that's for the person who's having a mental health, health crisis. Um, I think uh, a lot of this, uh, some of this, uh, you know, particularly the authority for custody, I think most police officers know, you know, we don't have a lot of policies about, you know, when I can arrest certain people or, or but uh, this authority for custody, I think is, is kind of so people in the community reading the policy can really understand that the police officers can ret re restrain the liberties of people, not just when they uh, have established probable cause to commit a crime, but when they're a danger to themselves or others um, and there are people who may have questions why uh, we don't seize things like firearms from people who are suicidal um, so this I think this answers a lot of questions for the, the questions that could be posed to the community um, that we could have you know st struck and make this more brief but that's kind of my best attempt at an answer there for you miss no I do have one follow-up question mm -hmm. Can I um, so in um, section 418.3.3 under initial response under A, um, it talks about um, that I think that's the first place in the policy that CIT is referenced and of course um, at least I didn't see it before that and it's not defined so that might be um, a yes. good place to define um, CIT. Did I miss it? Is it, I no, think I don't. Think no, I don't think you did. That. I think I happen to know what that is just because I've been on the sure. commission long enough and they worked on that. Could you, um, could you um, remind us what uh, the crisis intervention training and team does in conjunction with like this policy yeah. and what how they fit into the picture here? Certainly. Before you respond, yes, sir. Stop it for the folks who came in a little later. There is a copy of the policy on the table if you'd like to pick it up and follow along. I don't know if you've got a copy. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, uh, CIT is uh, crisis intervention training, and it is. We did our training on the Memphis model, and in 2009, when this policy was written, every officer has received uh, 40 hours of uh, crisis intervention training, and not every officer. At one point, I don't know if it was in the development of this policy or right before or for a period afterwards, not every officer was, uh, had attended that training. So there were calls on the screen where um, they would dispatch certain officers who had, who had this training as primary officers who could go and with the understanding that they've had this 40 hours of training and that they were going to try to use those skills from that 40-hour training to, to de-escalate. That's pretty much the theme of crisis intervention training is de-escalation. Um, so, so, you know, subheading A,
goes on that premise that it, it, when it says a CIT officer should be dispatched, that's almost that's almost it goes without saying. Now you could just say any officer. You could you could strike this because um, all officers will receive that forty hours of crisis intervention training. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I also want, wanted to agree with Tamara that I thought this was a really well written policy and I didn't really see anything to change. And I had the same question on what CIT stood for, so I'm glad that got cleared up. And you talked about the 40 hours of training. Is that as part of their initial training before they're um, release, uh, put out on the streets, or is it at some point during? Wh when does that 40 hours? It's 40 hit? hours for incumbents. Okay. Uh, we, it's not, if there is any CIT training, it's abbreviated in the academy. But every incumbent will get 40 hours. And I, I don't know if we're at 100 percent, but we're awfully close right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Joe? Um, I was going to be extremely impressed if this was the first cut at this policy. <laughs> um, but I guess since it's been around. It's been around for a while. Yes, okay. Um, the one thing, reading through it, um, I, I, I thought it was really well written. The only thing that, that um, bothered me was in uh, 418 or 418.5, where it says in the second paragraph, officers will make transparent transport patients in a patrol unit and will secure them in accordance with a handcuffing policy. Now I wonder um, about that and whether uh, if you have somebody who has uh, mental illness problems and you start to restrain them. Uh, if you're not going to provoke an episode. Yes, and if you're not going to bring a contest, Ma'am, ma'am, appreciate you wanting to be part of the conversation, but we had a time in the beginning for comments from the public. And we that that, that, that is expired. I understand yeah. that, and I'm sorry, but we, but we really can't interrupt the meeting anytime someone would like to speak out, so I'm just going to ask you to monitor. And if you have any concerns afterwards, we'll be glad to take them. Oh, all right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I was a little bit concerned about that. Uh, other than other than that, so is there is there sort of some sort of secondary, you know, um, thoughts about or some thoughts about that issue? Well, I would submit that <coughs> handcuffing somebody in a mental health crisis can go any number of ways. Mm -hmm. I've seen it go very successfully. Uh, I've also seen it go very unsuccessfully and to the point where force had to be used. And you know, the, <coughs> the, the nature of police work is, is reactionary. And we'll, officers are always going to do their best to de-escalate a situation with somebody. And, Part of the CIT training is is de-escalating and then and just informing the person who you're dealing with what's happening, what's occurring, and trying to allay any fears or concerns that they might have about handcuffing or going to jail. And uh, I will uh, be honest with you, there there have been instances where maybe a, a mental health evaluation, um, you know, officers have some discretion mm -hmm. about when and how they handcuff. And um, I can't think of a specific instance on the top of my head, but I'm sure there's been an instance where um, certain conditions are met uh, that a, you know, somebody's handcuffed very briefly or handcuffed in front to try to allay some of the concerns. Um, we also have cahoots who mm -hmm. if, you know, you know, handcuffing is usually a last resort, um, but it's also f for safety for me, safety for the person who's going to to the uh, uh, University District Hospital for the evaluation. Um, but sometimes we can, uh, if again, if certain conditions are met, kind of broker a deal where um, our friends at Cahoots can give them a transportation that's free of handcuffs and mm -hmm. it's a lot more comfortable. And we like to do that because it's more comforting to the person going to the um, University District Hospital. It frees up an officer who doesn't have to take them. You know, we, we don't need to put handcuffs on. Sometimes it seems almost silly, uh, but it, again, it's it's for my safety. It's for the safety of the person yeah. in the vehicle. So, yeah, we think about it sometimes. And I guess the short answer is sometimes we can, and sometimes we can't because my attempts at de-escalation may not be 
yeah. as successful as they should have been. I mean, my, my, you've, you've essentially answered it to, you know, largely to my satisfaction. However, it would strike me that if, if some suggestion were put in in this area that, um, you know, getting cahoots to intervene may be a way to avoid a potential crisis or a, um, an indignation to a person who otherwise is not deserving of that indignation. That there may there may be some value to um, modifying this section slightly. Mm -hmm. no, one more, just follow up to that. Sure. So, sometimes, uh, you know, we wouldn't. You know, if somebody is, uh, th this may be framed for more specific thoughts about m mental health crisis and. And this, this, not to sound, say the author was short-sighted, but this, this may be geared to strictly, um, or the, the thoughts of this person when they wrote it was uh, a suicidal subject, somebody who is, mm -hmm. who is contemplating uh, a suicide attempt or has made a suicide attempt. There are some instances where we couldn't involve cahoots, but we, we can certainly get this in. I, I, I'm kind of shocked that it's not referenced earlier, but as an option. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Cahoots is referenced in 418.3.4. Yeah, so mm -hmm. early on. But yeah. not in that but not capacity. for transport. Yeah. Not, not in the context. I'll put myself last. Thank you. My, my question was, uh, and maybe the chief can answer, is how many Cahoots vans are in play right now? You just have one? No, we doubled the contract a couple of years ago, so I think we have cahoots on the street from 11A to about 1A. So before noon until after midnight. Okay, so after midnight, there really isn't any, anybody else. We don't use, do we use uh, EMS or fire or anybody transporting people who are mentally in bad no, shape? Not to to no, not regularly. No. The we police wouldn't. are charged with taking them regardless yeah. if there's no cahoots available. And yeah. Unless there's another medical condition, right? Well, Otherwise, of course, yeah. yeah. But, but with absent that, well, mental illness is a mental yeah. condition. I, I just I can overdose. I'm concerned that. about. I mean, for years the police have had to do this because and 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 back when I was working on it, they used to put them in a in a police paddy wagon. I mean, it's it's quite a stigma uh, to be transported in a paddy wagon when you're have a mental condition that is. The health <coughs> so um, I just wondered if anybody has ever tried in Eugene to have uh, use ambulance transport as a substitute. Since we only have one cahoots van, I'm not certain whether that's ever been tried. Or not. With with medication overdoses, um, right? Any course, like yeah. there's that underlying mm -hmm. medical exigency. Mm -hmm. They always go with fire EMS in a okay. medical unit. Um, you know, I can't think of a specific instance. Um, I'm not painting fire as uncooperative, but they're just as busy as everybody else. And I think, if we, you know, until trying to get them to, to do that for us in the heat of the moment, I think they would do it. They certainly wouldn't probably want to make a regular use, you know, procedure out of it just by virtue of them being so busy uh, for other medical necessity transports that could get bumped because they're, they're doing that. Thank you. I do see the point. Does anyone else have any um, questions or suggestions, recommendations? Do we want to let this lay until next meeting, or do we want to? I didn't hear I heard one suggested change from, do um, you want to make that an emotion, Joe, or some in some way change the wording to that section? Or? Um. Yeah, I guess I guess to make a motion that um, that some wording be added to alert the officer um, uh, to use cahoots when uh, when transporting uh, patients, if possible, or alternative means cahoots or alternative means. Okay, we have a second for that. I'll second. Second by Bill. Any discussion on the motion? Do we want to leave the wording to 
to Matt to I, bring it back I would, to us? I would be fine okay. with that. So any other discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries, Matt. You can make that change and bring it back to us next month. And we yes, sir. We'll talk about the policy. Yes, sir. We also got the suggestion about defining CIT, so we can mm -hmm. do that oh, kind of yes, motion sir. if you like. Yeah. Thank you. Again, for the folks who came tonight, I know there are a few of you who came. Um, if you do have any suggestions, we still will take this up again next month. Certainly, please feel free to come and speak to us before the meeting uh, again and after the meeting tonight and at break. We have a break coming up soon, so we'll be happy to hear any comments you have. If you'd like to submit it in writing to the commission, drop, leave them with Carter, and she can uh, make them part of the uh, meeting notes that we have. Joe? I, I, I don't know. I have a feeling that we're probably close to the end of the mental health crisis with policy review. Yeah. Which, which means that the break is next and we are way ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. So I would be willing to reopen the, um, the public uh, comments for would folks. Would you like to make the motion? Yeah? Yes, I'd like to, yeah. Uh, make a motion to reopen public comments. Second. Second. Seconded by Jesse. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. We're back into item two, public comments. If you'd like to come forward and speak, yeah, we need you to fill, fill out a form for us so we can have a record of who you are. They're on the table right here. Okay. I'm Mary Ellen Kathleen Monday, and I'm a local mental health professional, and I've recently been having a child's mental health crisis, yeah. and I've had a horrible experience with Springfield Police Department and a horrible experience with the D. Okay. Um, well, then why don't you fill that out? Yeah. And then, and well, then it's, it's, the, blue, it's the blue form. The blue, yeah, blue, blue form. form. Yeah, just. Just fill out I've, never, I've never spoken at any kind That's of all right. government before. That's all right. Well, we're going we're gonna to have you join us at the table. I used to work for the city of San Francisco. Can I help you? Yes. Sure. I learned from this group a lot. I don't know if you know that. I appreciate all of you. Yeah. She'll let you know exactly. Could you bring that right here, please, ma'am? Right. Hi. And give Hi. us the Tamara. Okay. And so, then, and feel free to take a seat at the table. Yeah, if you want to sit down here. And then um, you'll have three minutes. Okay. And when you have um, 20 seconds left, I'll hold this up. And okay. then when your time's up, I'll hold this up. Great. Somebody Thank sit you. in there. I'll just start one Whenever you start. There you go. Yeah. Where's, That's where's good, right there is perfect. I would like to sit this way. First of all, I would like to thank the compassionate comments that were made. And I am an individual who has traumatic brain injury and PTSD secondary to severe child abuse. I also have a master's degree in public health and I'm a specialist in substance abuse. And then went on and got my MA in clinical psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies and then watching women be abused at Metropolitan State Hospital doing my pre-doc, I got CNS lupus. I was over-medicated with 290 of morphine, and of course, because of the side effects of the 290 of morphine, I was put on antidepressants and all sorts of drugs. And I realized that the drugs were causing a mental status change. I was in a foster home in Springfield. The person lied. I was handcuffed and transported after I'd been raped and taken to UD where I was mistreated so profoundly I couldn't believe it. And I have been tormented. I am terrified to have any contact with peace officers after what has happened to me. I was given a drug that I'm allergic to and I had pseudo seizures for six hours. Which, a pseudo seizure is when you have grandma activity but you are awake. I was locked in a room for six hours. Peace Health is malicious. There is a doctor there named Michael Barkman who needs to be arrested for assault and battery because he gave me a drug I was allergic to. 
and I have suffered neurological consequences ever since. And I have heard individual after individual after individual talk about abuse by this doctor. And the Board of Medical Examiners is doing nothing, and he's still practicing. This, there is not a capacity to treat people who have mental health crises in Wayne County. And there is no capacity to treat children. And I don't know what to do about this. I know there's an appointment. But we have a problem. And as someone who has been on both sides of the fence, I am desperately concerned about the opioid addiction that's going on. The fact that the Board of Medical Examiners is making policies that they are not enforcing. And that there is a doctor who has two pain licenses. One of them is right here, Peter Kosick. And then there's James Morris on River Road, who are passing out opioids at a horrendous rate. And nobody's doing anything about it. And then when you go in Subutex, or it can cause neuropsychiatric side effects, and you go ballistic when you're withdrawing from these poisons. And nobody is appreciating how dangerous these drugs are. And you can't get treatment if you don't take the drugs. And the drugs cause more problems. And that's all I wanted to say. I don't have any answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming forward. It took a lot of courage, I know. I well, it's you. scary as hell. Thank you. Um, I, you, know, you guys frightened me. Okay, you did talk. very well. Thank you. You need to fill one of these forms. Would you like to fix them? Yeah, we need to get you to fill out one of those forms. Put your Hello, my name is Eric Frau Schneider. Thank you for allowing me to talk. I am diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Uh, I've been homeless for for three months. I just got a uh, shelter care grant, and I'm now housed in Eugene. Um, I was living in Portland when um, when in the Housing Authority of Portland, there was also a wanted criminal parole violator living there named Stephen Lowell Stanley. He had a background of illegal weapons possession and kidnapping. He threatened my life as seen by the building manager in November of twenty of twenty eleven, and was uh, and the police came. The building manager Dennis Mitchell confirmed this. Um, he came, um, the police came, did nothing. During the next eight months, the police came to the building over half a dozen times. Um, there, was, uh, there was multiple restraining notices in court. Mine on Stephen Will Stanley succeeded, um, and his on Earl Mac Williams failed. Uh, the police said there's no warrant. They would, they would not look him up. Um, the, the policy is that if you, have, if you are a wanted criminal living in the Housing Authority of Portland, you do not have to have a background check. You could just be evicted. Uh, being evicted endangers the entire society when the criminal is a kidnapper and a wanted, uh, which he was by Ohio, a parole violator. Uh, this, this story you can... Uh, you can follow more along. He also, he was, there was no trial. He conceded to his eviction. I went to the DA's office and said, they're evicting him now. Why don't you do a background check on him before he starts to shoot people? He was arrested on fugitive charges, fell on EU. There was no trial. He, con he conceded to the eviction. And um, when there's no trial, there's nobody there to say how they, ha how they feel that the Housing Authority of Portland has endangered people's lives. Um, so I, wondering if it's really a good idea 
to have a no background check policy on, on somebody before they are evicted. Um, because this, because obviously the background check policy failed and this guy was a wanted fugitive. So I would say that um, the, back, the, the, re, the backup system for checking a wanted criminal should be restraining those in a court of law, um, s proving that he has been a danger to other people's lives. Um, in response, the housing authority accused me of a felony assault um, which, which I feel is more than an act, which is, I feel is more than an act of landlord retaliation. I feel is an, it's an act of terrorism. In, so I, they have not pressed charges on me in two years. Maybe it could, because it was a fabricated, made-up story designed to drive me to become homeless. Um, I'm feeling much better now. I am in. Uh, I'm studying Tai Chi. And I am one of the best hula hoopers in the United States at spinning a hula hoop uh, on, uh, around my shoulder well, and transferring it your time is back up. and forth. Thank, Thank you, you very much. That's, your time is can up. I say one more thing? No. We actually are finished. Thank you very much, though. We appreciate your comments. Okay. We have Thank an you. agenda Thank we you. have to Thank stick to. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe next Thank one. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for, you. for having me. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, go on the next item of the agenda now and take a break. We'll be back here in uh, let's see, we've got 10 minutes. 10 minute break, right. Be back in 10. Okay. I said by Facebook that I'm here and we're missing Mike Clark again. <laughs> Give him a bad time. I do. <laughs> remember the mic is still on. Pardon? The mic is huh? still on. That's okay. My book is still I should have mentioned that uh, he was coming to the of the community. From Sam's side. That was a good turn in your office. Did you have one? No. You didn't? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. And I'm trying to go. And these guys are in there because. Oh, that's the one that you put. And they're like, no, we're not interested. Yeah. Go away. I said, well, how if I just leave you some brochures? I told you to go away. Oh, really? If I wasn't with the little kids. Yeah. Oh, these conversations are like this. I think it's been 59 in these I was with a very articulate young man, and everybody he saw was pretty receptive, except one guy who had his door wide open in that upstairs apartment, and we were like, hello? And he like, no. And then he like noticed us in his doorway, and he's like, you know, kind of taken aback that we're standing in his doorway. He took the materials, he didn't say anything rude, but you could tell he didn't look very it was like being locked. Was it door to door or apartment? Door to door. Apartment houses. The whole university district. Yeah, they would assign us um, beats, sort of like you know, like we have two blocks to be covered, and we have like no power. And so, like some had some were apartment units that had like a whole bunch of units, but some of them, a lot of them had a whole bunch of units, but they were mostly empty. One guy that answered the doors. Nobody lives in any of these are away. So like, really? Yeah. 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 Started. I have no idea that they had like that kind of vacancy in some of these. I always thought they were all. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. 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 When I was, but they built so many. I was going to school. Well, yeah, right? I just want, I wondered if it was that or just But like, there were some houses. Some were business. You know, it was business, so we didn't have to go there. Oh, yeah. Some were yeah. students somewhere. So the only one that, that I was scared, I didn't know on their door, there was this little one on an alley that um, had a note on their door that said, no solicitation, no, uh, no selling, no something else. And then it said, if you knock on this door, you use sprays. It's like, yeah, I think I'll pass it. I don't think I need to knock on the door, because I don't know if they considered this solicitation or not. So we can just skip this one. They probably don't want our materials anyway. He was given yeah. I didn't want to find out what you get sprayed by. <laughs> I have a no trespassing sign. Small one on my door. No solicitation. I'm not soliciting. I'm just informing you. I mean, yeah, I didn't know if they would think that was a solicitation. No, he's just going. Just going this guy. Just one of the party motor officers. Solicitation. Is still still yeah, or enrolling somebody. Yeah, anything. Enrolling. And we were just giving information, but I didn't want to take a chance. I was just like, yeah. he was just around. I'm good. 
Yeah, that's you do your best. Guys. You'd have to have a trespass charge. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was right on the alley, so you had to walk through a big yard to get there. It's like two steps, you're at the back, you know, the front porch. But mm. it was fun, though. Yeah. Only thing is, I wish it wasn't as fun. Yeah. 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 Police Commissioner arrested for trespassing. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, one of the favorite ones. The way burglars have it between what? One and three o'clock in the afternoon. They knock on your door, nobody's home, and so they go around, you know, around the back. If you have a no trespassing sign, then they're a lot less, maybe less than they do. Well, we have a dog, and I have an alarm system. That's what I remember. That doesn't mean they still can't break in, it just means they have to be really fast. If you're looking for low hanging fruit and the dog barks at the door when you knock. Yeah. It makes He's it. a 60 pound dog. It's not like a little. <laughs> it's a little, dog it's a little less low hanging one. Yeah. yeah. Deter, usually. Yeah, yeah it was fun though. That's, they, that's the best deterrent you can get. They did a really good job though. The brochures that we had that were nice, the pamphlets that were like colored and it told them all the things about how to keep their belongings safe and it had like a whole list of information there. I wish I would have had one to bring with me. I should have brought it with me. But and then they had one that had like this whole cut was all about how to party responsibly and not like get in trouble and what happens if you have people at your house how to control your own situation and avoid getting citations. So I thought it was really good. It was some good good information in those publications and how to be a good neighbor, get to know your neighbors, how to deal with other neighbors. You just make sure they get invited to your parties, so Yeah. And then they had an alternative dispute resolution pamphlet in there too. Which was good. We we said anyone could access but it was mostly um, um I think it's kind of a bit we're, we're gonna probably open the building so open really the branch. That's really meant for I think sometimes students and landlords just, just as like a soft opening thing. Students. Oh, okay. Just to kind of get, get the bugs working. I've been out. supervising the board. So I think like around yeah. February, yeah. around the, the last February. three weeks. How's that going? I'll, I'll tell you what, this, board this board year is like no because. other in terms of <laughs> getting <laughs> cooperation. Not to put you on the spot or anything. So few calls. Really? A lot. It's like the first two weeks. I mean, we used Hopefully to have kind of scorched earth yeah. policy oh, because we had to, in a because way, it would just, it would, it would soon, if we didn't just, you know, bat it completely down, it would, you know, we'd have couches on fire, oh, yeah. wild parties, oh, yeah. and you know, dumpsters in the middle of the intersection. Yep. I remember those two weeks, we didn't take a single person to jail because of the cooperation and just the lack of, I mean, the first weekend it was real busy because all the students were excited, and it was the newer kids to college. Yeah, really stripped down on After that, it has been, I mean, knock on wood, I don't want to jinx myself because I'm doing it this weekend, but it's been yeah. Wow, that's and pretty we, amazing. And we cite it here, so it's a cooperative yeah. part of the yeah, building. Yeah, she talks right. about that when we move that air to the floor part. part. You're, you're of outside bringing everything outside. The, the efforts right, right. that yeah. the cycles through group you are a part of, I think it's been different, because I've seen those red solar cups. Yeah, they're very, they're well done. The red solar cups, it's... It connects with the kids. They they look at it. Or you just gave them some brochure. I don't think they look. It's in color. It's oh, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. really well. And it's very brief. It's not like a lot of text. It gives the points. It's pretty brief. Talks yeah. about what, what is a crime. You know, you can go to jail for just having a beer out of public. Yeah, but, it's pretty good. Uh, it, yeah, I think and I, that I that think next with the students. Yeah. Our, when I first, you know, I've seen it in ten years. You know, we yeah. used to just ignore the problem, I, and I, that I, was bad yeah. <laughs> because this, right. the, there, yeah, there was no problem. Yeah. We just didn't know about it until it was too late. Yeah. I mean, literally, literally actually, beer bottles out of second, third floor store yeah. windows in the street. But you're hoping assault. I mean, violent assaults on other students or people downtown. I mean, just really bad stuff. Yeah. And then we started to be we were starting to be proactive, but so was the university. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think when that we're coming from both ways, open yeah. space. Because the university, um, I mean, um, the, the, the in it? president, to he to to went on the oh, walk so and walked, walked in, you know, it's, route it's with people, with, with, with Kitty Pierce, I think or Chief Kearns. I think the three of them were actually together. He was Chief Kearns, Kitty, and Michael Gottfried. I don't know the No, he's the old one. He's the whoever the interim is. Yeah, went together. That seems to have worked. Yeah. For my.
Well, the university also stepped up their code of conduct, like that it could be enforced for um, behavior off campus too. Which oh, that's they did. in one of the. Mm. I think that hopefully that will change. Keep you busy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, went nuts. Actually, I, I shot some <laughs> video. Yeah. Um, You've seen a different perspective. No, yeah. I, I, the university went nuts in their, the the new conduct code. We had a oh, we had a video oh. shoot about the orientation. Um, at the university this fall, this fall I, it just seems like every year there's a, a paid gig that I wind up at well, doing the university. Which day do you want to run? Well, my impression this year was that the, so we were there the first day that the students were moving in. And my impression was that it was much better managed overall in terms of orientation and everything else that the university, university was doing. Sorry, I don't like uh, no, just pick uh, up. Pick up. No, we're a minute. Can, uh, I'll, I'll give you my email. And yeah, when you get Mark going sometimes, you can just email. <laughs> well, me too. He's fun to talk. Well, everybody's you back. Guys went, and, was um, it you and Kitty Kersey and um, everybody is back. And, uh, so I suppose we can go ahead and get started. Who did you go with? Um, somebody from. Oh, was it Kitty and um, the president? Probably. There's no period between that. Okay, okay. Curtis queued up the uh, chief support, and we'll go ahead and uh, <coughs> go over real quickly. And if you have any questions, <coughs> we have the report in your packet. Right? Yes, yeah, right. okay. okay. So I, I won't go into great detail. Uh, okay. What time do you guys on the on the first page, chief's activities? I think you know what most of this is. The KUGN and KZI morning shows are just right. conversations. Community court is uh, a model. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. Not very. Not yet, maybe, yeah. but you will be if we go this way. Is a, um, we have, the, the municipal court has a grant to explore it, um, the suitability of our municipal court for transitioning to a community court, which is sort of this holistic approach to um, the repeat um, visitors to the municipal court system. Um, ACLU, so I think some of you were at the ACLU Civil Conversations. Um, I met with someone from the City Club to ask, who asked about uh, having a similar uh, program there. Um, we are in the hiring process for the Division Manager for Operations Support. Had a great uh, Police and Chiefs and Sheriffs uh, Conference where we heard speakers on um, body-worn cameras, Chief from, um, Sergeant Mullen was there too. Chief from uh, Fresno and uh, Salt Lake City, and then I had to leave early, but Taser also made some uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on a panel for the League of Oregon Cities Conference to talk about uh, dealing with crisis, uh, and that was good. Did the committee welcome, but uh, Tamara also did. And then there's a few news items, and then um, <coughs> What you see in uh, the uh, DLP mapping is that we're having probably a typical year, but again, uh, we're collecting the numbers differently, so it's hard to, hard to compare to previous years. Uh, but it looks like burglaries are starting to go up a little bit, and uh, bicycle thefts are following their typical pattern when they go up in the late summer and uh, first part of September and then drop way off after everybody's bicycles been stolen. Starts all, around, <laughs> starts all over the next spring. Uh, if you go to uh, the slide that says last week's area of focus, I always admire what the crime analysis unit can do where they point out uh, the percentage of offenses that are, that are occurring, the target offenses that are occurring on the certain days of the week and certain hours of the day. <coughs> Our patrol sergeants use that information to, to steer where the patrol officers spend most of their time. Uh, next page is a more on the area of focus. Um, the uh, street crimes focus for September 14th to September 20th. Scobert Park in the spring and summer is always one of those places we have to spend some time on. Uh, we always see uh, some drug sales, heroin use, a little in, in prostitution that happens there in addition to the lower level offenses. A um, few people here, uh, William Webb and Jay Hanna, and another one that's mentioned, uh, Blue Clark, have been um, serial offenders. In, and uh, they were Blue Clark, although I can say that here, has since been arrested. Uh, and then uh, you know about looking ahead on that page, you see 
Uh, you all know about the joint meeting that we have next week. Uh, and then um, the uh, Oregon Social Learning Center has, uh, is hosting a luncheon where we can have a conversation with uh, researchers from OSLC and our uh, Oregon Research Institute on how we can uh, how, how law enforcement and academia can work together to improve our practices and services. We have some uh, personnel processes in place. And that's about it. Can I ask a question yep. about your, um, on, what, on the legend here, one of the, that I don't recognize from before, but maybe I just don't remember, is a note for MD parts. Motor vehicle parts. Yeah, is that a new note on there? I've never yeah, seen that is, one uh, That is new. We must have had some activity. Oh, and what is that yeah, like stealing that. gas or? Or uh, do you know, Sergeant Long? Catalytic, Catalytic converter theft Catalytic 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 was, yeah. was always hot. Yeah. yeah. It kind of goes in and out of yeah. cycle metal as, as, yeah, there's metal prices come and go. Hmm. That was real big about, what, four or five years ago and yeah. then yeah. it really died down? Yeah. yeah. Metal prices dropped. Yeah, they arrested the two guys who were doing the OEG. Okay, that Go ahead. You talk about um, speaking with the ACLU about uh, our, our policy. I guess it sounds like the. Uh, did they have any other suggestions that they. This was. Uh, or just something this wasn't. Okay, go this was a, a community conversation the ACLU had. There were two panelists. <coughs> Um, Richard, no, Eric Richardson, the president of the local chapter of the NAACP, and Juan Carlos, who you all know. And uh, we weren't invited. Uh, we were invited like every other member of the community. So um, it was intended to be a, a conversation about, I think, bias based policing and people's fears around that. And then uh, our policy was sort of a central piece to it. Uh, and I met with. Um, the um, uh, local president of the ACLU chapter. They're all volunteers, you know, they're, since Claire, Claire's position was uh, downsized, it's basically all volunteers that work in the local office and they get support from the state. Um, and um, I think I, we, the police department needs to have a little bit more of an ongoing relationship with the local ACLU so they can come to us with concerns and, probably help us improve our services. And you, you commented on, on, in the news where it talked about the homemade bombs found and detonated in North Gillum. Um, I didn't, I assume there was probably an article in the news. I missed that one, I guess. Um, did, did you have suspects? Did you? You know, I don't who? know much about that case. That was the one uh, headline I was hoping nobody would ask. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Jim. <laughs> Uh, but I knew you would have asked. If anybody did, you would. I don't know much about that one, but it isn't unusual for bomb making is a, a remarkably common thing, uh, and um, so we're our uh, explosive disposal unit uh, learns about them and uh, serves sort of search warrants, and uh, they collect the bombs and people are charged. Uh, I don't know about the details in this, but I know that it's not that unusual. I'm just wondering if they caught the people that had made the bombs. And yeah, I don't know in this case. Joe. Um, yeah, uh, further on the ACLU thing, uh, just curious what their impression was uh, with the policy, since apparently that was uh, being talked about. Uh, there were a lot of people in the room, so I don't, uh, if you all, I, I don't know what their impression is, but I can tell you a few comments that I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, Juan Carlos went through sort of, uh, I guess you'd call it the headlines of uh, complaints of bias-based policing <coughs> that he's heard and that people in the Latino community have heard. And, you know, they're upsetting when all you know is what the initial um, complaint is. Uh, and sometimes that's exactly what happened, and it does make you wonder. And uh, other times you find out that the motivation for the officer was very different. Inevitably, what you learn is that there are two the thoroughly different perspectives that are in that encounter. You know? mm -hmm. And that's something we need to, as police, need to learn to figure out. So that's one thing. The other is that uh, some people, I've heard this uh, more than once, will read that policy, that professional contacts policy, 
and uh, they'll wonder where the sensitivity is to uh, people of color and other mm -hmm. protected groups. Um, and when I ask about it, they say, well, where is the clarity on, um, uh, on asking that police don't engage in profiling, you know, racial profiling? To me, it seems clear, but to a person who feels as though uh, the population that they belong to has been taken advantage of by law enforcement, it feels as though it's not clear enough. Mm -hmm. So that's enlightening. Um, do you remember? Carter might need to help me remember some of the other. Uh, <coughs> oh, they, they, uh, they ask questions about uh, pretext stops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the courts allow police to make pretext stops, which is where we'll see someone that we know is a known property offender, and they'll, they'll be missing a tail light or won't signal 100 feet before a turn. We'll stop them for that infraction and hope that while well, during our legitimate contact with them, we may learn about whether or not they're up to committing some felony. Uh, that, the pretext stops worry people uh, in, the, uh, in the context of bias-based policing because they're concerned that we'll see a person of color and for that reason find a reason to make a stop to see if they're committing a crime. Mm -hmm. So that's a legitimate thing to be worried about. Pretext stops, in my view, in my profession, are a good and important tool for police to have for the first scenario that I described, because we know, when we know somebody is, if they're out and about, they're probably committing a crime, when we know that, we got to figure out a way to prevent those from happening. Uh, so I totally get the fear, and uh, I think it's something we need to address. I'm not remembering anything else. I thought they did a good job of managing the conversation, and uh, Dave Fidanke uh, was there. You all know who Dave is, I think. Mm -hmm. um, some some folks voiced uh, at least two people were very clear that they're unhappy with the policy the way it is and think it needs to be stricter mm -hmm. more strict and uh, Juan Carlos uh, repeated that he thinks reference to the level of discipline that an officer would receive if they violate the policy should be on there interestingly Dave Fidanke commented that he thought the policy was a great first step policy so it was Intriguing to have the host of the meeting <coughs> support the work and from the ACLU, support the commission, I mean the department and the policy. Yeah, the reality is we're not the first and best at putting together policy. We're not in last place either. Uh, we're ahead of most of the departments in Oregon, mm -hmm. but you know, we'll, we'll keep trying to get better at this stuff. Yeah. All right. First of all, I'm going to point out that on the activities it's mentioned is the policy on biased conduct. It's just naturally kind of what it's called. <laughs> um, and then I've got two questions about items in the news. I guess I was going to ask about this anyway. Um, <laughs> Dean Sweden was beat to death on August 21st. The last update from the police department was on August 22nd. Mm -hmm. He's a uh, he was an unhoused kid, and it didn't get a. It was, it was like two column inches in the, the guard, and that was the extent of the coverage there's been to that. Is there anything you can talk about, or the, is the police going to release, are the police going to release any updates? Uh, we put out a pretty standard uh, press release on that, and the media, of course, prints only what they want. Um, and then, uh, like a lot of um, death investigations, um, we will uh, lock down the information uh, in order to protect the integrity of the investigation. And I believe that's where we are right now. I haven't talked with our violent crimes unit about it for about a month. That was where we were then. Understandable. Um, I mean, there's definitely a disparity in, in who, somebody else who is beat to death in the middle of downtown at 1.30 in the morning um, would be getting a whole lot more attention, a lot more questions, uh, push for other suspects. Um, but I hope things are moving along. I hope that something gets found out about that. Yeah, the last time I've thought about this, uh, it was because, um, and I want to say it's a couple weeks ago now, someone had called a complaint about the same thing you're mentioning. It didn't get much attention. So uh, our PIO, Public Information Officer Melinda, McLaughlin looked into what we'd done and we actually gave out quite a bit, bit of information initially. 
Okay. And other question kind of goes along with the policy we talked about earlier. The, I heard about the regional crisis intervention training that had multiple departments for the first time. How did that, how was it? It's good. Uh, if you don't know the story about how that came about, I'll share it real quick. Um, the uh, Whitebird Clinic was actually uh, the, um, took the lead on this whole effort and some time ago uh, envisioned, um, and I think it's a good idea, the, a regional deployment of CAHOOTS bands rather than just in Eugene or just in Springfield, you know, um, and, uh, and also better uh, care for people who are homeless with mental health conditions. And so um, applied for a grant, but uh, Whitebird can't be uh, the applicant. And I believe uh, Lane County was ended up being the applicant, or it might be Lane County uh, Behavioral Health. So they applied for a grant that would help to establish this regional deployment of CAHOOTS vans and crisis intervention training. And there, I think there were some other aspects. The grant wasn't enough to, to set up the regional deployment, but uh, there will be one in uh, sort of a metro van in Springfield and in uh, Central Lane County while we still maintain our contract in Eugene. So that's quite an accomplishment, and it's got logistical complications that Whitebird is working through. Um, and then uh, the other piece of it was the CIT training. It was a standard training that we provide, which improves a little bit with every, uh, every rendition. And uh, so I think this one came off just as well as all the others. My only role in it was to uh, join Sheriff Turner and Chief Tim Doney for the Springfield Police Department and doing an introduction for a few minutes at the beginning. But what I've heard from the instructors is that it's gone well. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else with questions? Down. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? So I, I can't remember from the initial um, CIT training is there a community group that's involved in assisting with that curriculum? Is it NAMI or is there somebody up that, that group that helps with that? Yeah, NAMI has regularly been assisting us with it. Um, the uh, Salisbury family uh, helped quite a bit at the beginning and uh, when we uh, started providing it to every uh, incumbent officer, um, the Salisbury family came to one of those first trainings but right now it's NAMI and other uh, service providers around town. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll move oh, on. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to look if I don't know if anybody else had anything. I, just, I had one other question on the, the um, daily policing page on where it says September 24, 2014, where it talks about the residential burglaries are increasing in you know, beats 3, 5, and 6. Is that normal? For this time of the year as students come back or do you think it's even related to students coming back because i know that does not typically at least raise it downtown more activity and yeah i asked our um our crime analysis unit the same question and they sort of I mean, the, the peaks and valleys of that are so unpredictable and uh, their theory was that five thousand more people moved into town you know with the new freshmen and sophomores at the University of Oregon, so that's probably it. Could also be somebody was released from that's true. prison or jail or moved into town. Or is well. that normally a time frame that you'll see? Uh, it's normally, we normally see an increase in the summertime, not necessarily. Not necessarily when the students come back. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay, we need to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the uh, uh, Downtown Public Safety Camera System Policy 606. That before you proposed policy. Um, I don't know if everybody's had time to read it or not. I did, but I mm -hmm. need a moment. In the meantime, if someone has questions or anything from that, please just remember. While we're going to silence, then I'd just like to point out, I am um, in Virginia, the uh, University of Virginia is located in Charlottesville, Virginia. It's a very quiet town, uh, really, you know, hardly ever has problems to speak of, the normal stuff that happens with the university. But um, there, were, there have been two girls who have been kidnapped, young 
young co-eds that were kidnapped and uh, forgive me that's probably an academic, academic term but I, I still use it co-eds if, um, if they were kidnapped um, one was found relatively soon by a farmer out in the field covered up uh, some brush and this latest one has not been found but I mention it because at some point intervening with the two kidnappings and murders they have a suspect in custody now because of DNA that they found but in between that this young lady walked across what's called the mall at the University of Virginia campus they have an area down there where um, they wanted to put it's a public square and they wanted to put CCTV cameras up and the Charlottesville Council voted no that they thought it might be an invasion of privacy to put those cameras up but it was our understanding that what, what I hear is that when she was taken she was taken from that area and there were no cameras to there's only one camera on a business that actually got a kind of a blurry fuzzy view of someone in the background that they think might have been her but it just goes to what I was saying a couple of weeks ago regarding <coughs> what people feel is an invasion of privacy and what happens when something awful happens to your child and when you think about what could have been done if council had voted to put those cameras up between the two crimes perhaps they could have you know prevented the tragedy that ended up happening. They haven't found her body yet, but you know, I'm just saying. It just to me, you need every tool you can get in your belt, and uh, that's one of them. It was just a shame when I saw that. So, and relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, now, any questions, uh, problems, questions about the policy itself, or maybe general questions you have for Matt, Jim? Well, I, I again, I thought the policy was 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 pretty well written. I didn't really see anything. Um, but I, I'm sure that other, other people did. Um, but I did have some questions. Have you, how close are you to deploying the cameras? Or yeah, it, maybe it, maybe I could begin by saying maybe that would things if you know. Sure, yeah, yeah. that'd be great. Uh, we, I don't have any uh, plans to put up cameras. Um, what uh, I really like the. Um, new technology policy that you talked about last time it generated I thought quite a bit about it after listening to your discussion very useful to me uh, because there are there's perfectly good technology for police departments to use which also raise a lot of fears and concerns and so if um, if uh, CCTV systems are good for Eugene then um, we ought to approach it carefully and uh, I'm interested in, I would, I would be interested if the police commission wanted to take it on as a pilot project to help develop, first have the discussion of the uh, efficacy of a pilot project for CCTV cameras, but then uh, if, they, uh, if the commission is interested to help me develop a pilot project uh, to experiment with one or more cameras, and then uh, before we implemented it, an interim policy that could be used exclusively for the pilot project. Um, so there is no immediate plan, okay. uh, and I wouldn't move forward unless uh, until I first had a conversation with the community, and I thought perhaps the police commission could help with that. Okay, George. I'd be. I. I, I think, you know, the cameras downtown are the same thing as the cameras on. Uh, on the police officers, you're always on your best behavior, and I think it would deter crime a lot. There is a privacy issue, and interesting enough, I did read a letter to the editor yesterday about the guy they have infrared detectors up on the poles to control traffic lights, and he thought those were cameras. Well, they're infrared cameras, they're not video cameras, uh, uh, but there is some paranoia out there. Uh, and obviously some misinformed people if they think the, the uh, infrared motion detectors up on those are, are, are cameras uh, doing the intersections. So they do look like cameras, but I, I think it is, a, um, it is a, a very good tool. And the whole thing, smile, you're on camera, candid camera, but it was a, it was a very good idea and would be very, very efficient for uh, a very, very good tool for Reducing crime and catching criminals. 
Um, yeah, I guess, I guess as I was reading this uh, before the meeting, um, the, the thing that struck me was, um, are there any thoughts about a map of where you might want to place cameras? And how much, how much actual crime, you, you know, I mean, I sort of think about, well, okay, you, could, you can sort of put them on a bunch of places downtown, but as we, start, as we look at a lot of the, you know, maps over here, you know, on these kinds of things, that wouldn't even come close to care, you know, covering um, a, lot of that, a lot of that crime. Are there, are there areas in the downtown, because that seems to be where we're talking, that actually have a high incidence of, of these kinds of crimes that, that we're sort of talking about capturing? I mean, is there, is there an economic return there um, in in Eugene, I mean, I go down, go down through, you know, I bike through town at, in the evening, and the place is a complete desert um, on you know many nights. Um, do we do we actually have enough crime traffic in certain areas to make this pay off? Is that what's your opinion there? Yeah, we we're not mapping that kind of crime. Remember, this is just uh, burglary, auto theft, thefts from cars that you see in these maps here. Mm -hmm. Um, there, uh, there is uh, violent crime and disorderly conduct, which is violent and tumultuous activity, mm -hmm. and um, that kind of behavior <coughs> downtown drug sales, uh, and it concentrates in certain places. Okay. Um, and we could probably map that. Uh, it hasn't been something we've tried to do because this has consumed so much time. Uh, what I would suggest is that um, before we rolled into a pilot project of this for even one one location uh, we would first do that analysis see what crime is occurring in mm -hmm. this place see if it's concentrated enough that a camera could capture it and then you know, do a before and after analysis of what the effect was mm -hmm. the other the other question would be is if you put a camera up is that going to move your your crime hotspot um, just to, you know, essentially out of range of the camera. I mean, will we get a, uh, an effective net change that, uh, that provides a benefit? Yeah, those are the things you'd ask going into a pilot project. Yeah. Uh, you know, anecdotally, what I'll tell you is that uh, for a time when uh, there were so many people congregating in the park blocks and we had a lot of calls for service and problems mm -hmm. there. I asked the patrol commanders to figure out a way to have an officer present uh, while those groups were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't eliminate the presence of people. The numbers went down, but it didn't eliminate the presence. And some thanked our officers for being there uh, because they were homeless. They had to mm -hmm. be somewhere. They liked being in the park, and they felt safer when the officer was there. Yeah. And we're trying to create the idea would be to create safety, perhaps reduce crime. Mm -hmm. So that would be the objective. Okay, Tamara and then Bill, thank you. So I, I, I would be very interested in um, uh, going forward with assisting the chief with the um, pilot project and interim policy and um, getting public input on that. And the question that Joe asked about is there a net benefit? I would say if one serious crime is prevented, if one murder uh, is solved because there's a camera there, I mean, perhaps if there had been a camera in the area where the young man was assaulted and, and ended up dying, perhaps that crime would be solvable where it may not be solved otherwise. So is it worth it? I'd say it's definitely worth it if it prevents something of that nature or solves a crime. Thank you, Bill and Jesse. Um, yeah, and, and I think, too, I think trying to give the police department all the tools that it can to not only help stop crime but help solve crime is great. And I think this policy is a good start, but I'd like to also maybe think about is there a way to put in this policy, you know, how we determine where cameras go. Maybe, you know, just sort of a guideline to say, you know, it has to have, you know, certain elements that would make it. You know, I think that helps public understand why we're doing things. If there's sort of a guideline that we kind of follow within our policies that says that's how we, instead of this one just says at the approval of the chief, you know, I think if we had more of a, you know, a few steps in there that have to be done to 
do that. Okay, Jesse, next. Thank you, Bill. If it was going to happen, I'd still rather see it not monitored, rather recorded, and if something happens, it can, the footage can go back, it can be viewed afterwards. Yeah. Those are the serious crimes that uh, I think we're talking about, caring about, not, not so much what you're going to see by sitting there monitoring it. That's just an invasion of privacy, and I don't find it paranoid at all. I have, um, I'm next to the queue, by the way. I have um, worked on the U.S. Federal Courthouse here in Eugene when they built that courthouse. They, they detached me from uh, my duties there, and I went over there with work with ADT on the cameras and to learn the system and how it computers recorded and, and to um, learn which cameras did what, and so I could help our guys learn how to monitor them. But they have a room over there with uh, 25 monitors. And I mean, it just has every camera that continues to switch. You can have the one monitor roll between five, six cameras. You can have one steady fixed on the entrance, the main entrance, for instance. Um, so there's a whole host of ways you can do it. But the biggest thing was that the cameras had a pan, tilt, and zoom, PTZ cameras, they call them, which meant they could pan, they could tilt either way you wanted to look at something, and you could also zoom in or zoom back out. So um, those cameras were most useful in a crisis situation when you needed to get a closer look at what's happening. So I looked at that policy and I, I saw what you saw and said, gee, you know, that wasn't what I was thinking. I was thinking it was going to be recorded onto a hard drive and, and then if they needed, they pull it off of there. But the problem with that is tactically, if something's going on right now and it's a crime in progress or something and someone can help, apprehend whoever the subject is, then certainly that type of camera would be more useful than than just having a hard drive with a fixed lens that maybe you don't get the whole thing, you know, maybe you're able to, to follow this crime a little bit better with the filter zoom. So um, that's all I had to say about that, but I, um, I, I, I'm I glad that we are doing this because I think whatever this is, turns out to be, how we get involved in the pilot project, I think we'll get we'll get through those concerns that people have about what how we're supposed to handle this. And George, you take your hand up? Yeah, it's real interesting, Jesse. To me, I'm, I'm so much into preventive maintenance and helping when help is needed. It's great for catching the crook, but what about the victim that is getting beat up and, yes, privacy would be invaded, uh, getting beat up and the police go oh, dispatch somebody there and it saves just one person's life or it saves a gal from getting hauled off I mean I, I understand yours but it's kind of like I didn't even consider that because I am so much into preventive maintenance or you know doing it as long and I think Pete assured us last time you know your question was what if somebody was putting their foot up against the wall are they going to go in there and bust them for trespassing and I got the surety it's the same as if the police were walking through there, they would use, or whoever's monitoring it, discretion, you know, you know, don't, but don't sweat the small stuff because I think they still have a lot to do, but I'm so much into the, uh, into the preventive maintenance and intervention of, of crimes happening that uh, I hear where you're coming from and there, there's a yin and yang of, of, yeah. of, 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 uh, of privacy versus, uh, yeah, uh, privacy versus, you know, I don't know, being in the moment uh, and preventing the stuff. And as Bob points out, to be able to, you know, these are general cameras, if somebody witnesses something, to be able to pan in and zoom in uh, to get a better view. Even if a crime happens, you'd have a better chance of catching who they were. So I, I, I appreciate what you say and, and didn't consider that possibility probably won't because of because of preventive maintenance of so. can I respond real quick uh, yeah sure we don't have anybody else in the queue right? okay. we could live in a perfectly safe society but I don't want to get to that point <coughs> okay. now uh, Joe you have uh, yeah I I've sort of accepted that cameras are, are kind of a reality in the world um, 
But my question is on the economics of the situation, because if you start to get involved in installing, um, you know, pa a pan, tilt, and zoom cameras all over the place with controllers, um, and you begin to staff them well enough that you can actually observe what's going on and detect a crime and deploy, um, you know, fast enough to be able to you know, have an impact on that. I mean, what are we looking at in terms of a cost uh, for a system of that nature? Um, so uh, is it, you know, again, you make the argument, well, if one person is saved, you know, fabulous, but um, at the same time, what's the cost of doing that? I mean, what would it cost to have a system where everything is monitored <coughs> so that we could essentially eliminate every, you know, point on this map. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know that that's economically feasible to do. Well, we've set aside plenty of time for this, so why don't everybody get your, your shot at Chief? No, I'll go. I, I'll go. I, just I just had it. That's, I just had a question, and then maybe it's what you're going to say, Chief, is that that's not how I envision this or how I read this policy as being written, that somebody's sitting there monitoring it the whole time. The way I read this is there'd be monitors up and when uh, further in get investigation reported or something's, um, oh, it says detected. I was thinking it's just when a call came in, that somebody had witnessed a crime, a call for service came in, then they could zoom in and see what was going on before an officer's dispatched. I wasn't thinking of it like, someone be sitting there watching the monitor the whole time even uh, you know we have a, a security uh, room at our facility and there's cameras all over the place there's no possible way you could have enough people to watch every single camera all the time it's just not humanly possible to do that uh, so as far as the live feed i was thinking that would be used uh, when a call for service came in and then if a car if a crime was reported in that area the footage that had been recorded would be looked at i wasn't mm -hmm. thinking that yeah. we, someone would be sitting there looking at well, i don't know how you could possibly afford to have you know labor's a very high cost i don't think that's what this is talking about but i'd like clarification from the chief i think you were first weren't you i have the chief, I have, sorry, I have the chief first then i have bill yeah. And then I have you, and then I have Joe. Okay, then this one. We're good. Now, what I was going to propose is that um, we can we can gather the studies that talk about the, about the upsides and the downsides to CCTV systems, mm -hmm. and share them with you, and um, and then um, the, you know the police commission could have a dialogue about whether or not it's the kind of thing that you would recommend that we experiment with. Keeping in mind that um, recommendation that, uh, for a pilot project could be very narrow. It could be one camera in one place that is a monitor that's fixed. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, really, the, I'm not, uh, there's enough concern about this that I'm not just going to launch a CCTV camera program from our department uh, without some guidance from a body like the police commission. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I have Bill, George, and Joe, but James uh, has not spoken yet, so I'm going to give him, move him to the head of the queue, and then Bill, George, and Joe. I, I appreciate that, and uh, uh, fellow commissioners, uh, didn't step on anybody's toes. Thank you so much. Sorry about the delay, uh, my late arrival, so I've had some things that I need to attend to. Uh, but uh, as I came in and started gathering some of the conversation about what's going on here, uh, there have been some good things that have come about uh, with EPD, uh, the use of uh, body cams and stuff that made the uh, register guard front page and uh, the use of the uh, in-car videos and stuff that's done. You know, a lot of even major metropolitan police departments are not equipped or haven't even employed, or employed those types of uh, tools and stuff uh, to help law enforcement. Um, but now we're talking about uh, the um, uh, Closed circuit uh, TVs, uh, CT, CCTV and stuff, and I'm 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 kind of confused now because uh, I know that Eugene is is one of the safest cities in the world, or in the United States. Uh, 
what is the what has happened that what has changed that uh, we are need to uh, expand outward with this additional technology that's you know I, I'm not something happened uh, have we have a, a, a rise in crime or is this for a preventive measurement or uh, so I'm kind of confused as to where we're going because I think statistically uh, crime is still down unless something happened when I went to sleep last night I'm not sure. <laughs> I can respond to that question. Uh, we're, for cities our size, for mid-sized cities, our property crime is in about the 80th percentile. But I don't, but I don't think it's property crime that uh, people are afraid of. Um, there um, is, uh, we're and in, and with violent crime, we're always somewhere around the 30th or the 50th percentile. Uh, there are a lot of people that feel unsafe uh, in the downtown core because of the behavior of people that gather there. And, um, and I'm not talking about because of the appearance of the people that gather there. I'm saying people, some people who are downtown are frightening in the way that they behave. Uh, and there, there are fights and um, disorderly conduct and drug sales and mm -hmm. uh, all those things that contribute to that. Some of it is behavior that you wish people wouldn't be afraid of. I'll give you that right now. There are adolescents that hang out downtown that we fear because they're adolescents and unpredictable. So that, there's that going on. But there is um, real crime, violent and disturbing crime that goes on in certain places downtown, and that would be the point of uh, putting up a CCTV system. Uh, and, and there are certain places where people gather. And in the last month, for instance, there's been uh, more violence and, uh, and more aggressive behavior around the LTD station. And our downtown officers have theories about that. There's been travelers who've uh, come into town and are still here. And uh, we've made a lot of arrests and had to use a lot more force than we like to in the last few weeks because of their behavior. So that, that would be the objective. Is there a way to uh, make an area safer uh, without always having to have a police officer present there. And um, I don't know in Eugene because we haven't done it. So that would be the point of a pilot project. Okay. Can I uh, do a follow up? With, with that understanding, then I can see that it would be something similar to a saturated patrol without having the actual uh, patrol there. And I can also see that it could probably be something that could be shifted to other areas once that, because crime is, as we indicated, just like a water balloon and stuff. You know, you push it here, it goes over there. And you put you, you push it over here, and then it goes over there. So it's, so would this also entail something that's mobile, or would it just be fixed for one area where you have the, uh, the ability to move, say, for example, once the crime falls out in that area because of this technology, uh, there is an increase in another area uh, that the same capability or the same equipment can be relocated to another area or just turned off and then turned on in, uh, another area or something. I, so I, I see where I see where it has benefit to stuff, but uh, you know the the actual de uh, deployment of them and and how long will they be deployed? Uh, because if the crime uh, subsides. Uh, will there be any further use for them in that particular area, or should it go someplace else? And then, if that's a trend uh, like the water, uh, then do we have the CCTs all around the city then eventually? Uh, just would you like to? Sure. Yeah. So I we're doing. <laughs> uh, that's the guidance I'm looking for. You're raising exactly the questions that I'd like answers to, and I could devise my own answers, but I'd rather. People with the concerns are helping me come up with them. Uh, what's the duration? What do you do if the crime drops way off? Well, what, what, what do you do if you know no crime ever happens there? What if you do? What, what do you do if what it's observing is unruly behavior, but not illegal or dangerous behavior? You know, um, I had another thought, but it's completely gone. Of course, it doesn't take much to. <laughs> It'll come back to me, and I'll interrupt you. And that's, that's fine. Uh, are you finished? Yes, Jim? thank you. Okay, I have Bill, George, Joe, and Jim. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit, and, and I understand um, Jesse's concern about this. And I think there's there's a little bit, and it's kind of in the policy that that um, Sergeant Lone has presented to us, is that it's who can look at these cameras and, and how it's tracked, I think, is important. Because, I mean, there's a lot of information that the police department can look at 
on individuals, but it's tracked on who's asking for that and why they ask for it. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think as long as we have those sort of controls that are in here, because it talks about it, that it's only going to be in the watch commanders and in central lane here. And, you know, people are assured of that, that nobody can just pull up these cameras and look at them or look at what's going on there. I think that would be one of those first steps in trying to alleviate that. Okay, and George? Uh, oh, I think my questions and comments have been Okay, Joe, Joe and then Jim. Um, yeah, I guess part of this was, well, I guess part of this was triggered for me by bringing up the concept of preventive maintenance um, because that, that raises, a you know, in order to put together a system to that level involves a staggering amount of cost. Um, and in the, in the discussion last month, I, I, I think I sort of indicated that I think, you know, some cameras that are placed around that could be a tree, retrieved after the fact, um, you know, are probably a, a useful, inexpensive way to get, you know, probably some better information to start um, solving a crime. Um, I'm, so I guess the issue is um, the sort of size and scope. Um, I mean, I pr probably in sort of following this not all that well over time, uh, the, the example that sticks out is, the, is London as a city that has just, you know, cameras, pan, tilt, and zoom cameras on every corner, you know, everywhere. And um, so I've sort of followed that a little bit, and, and there's been, you know, a number of documentaries done about people's attitude toward that and how, you know, the population thinks and, you know, mildly whether it's been effective or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but I guess, you know, there, there's sort of this kind of, you know, maybe some folks would look at it as a slippery slope thing. I mean, the first time we, you know, put a, a camera up and, you know, to record and then retrieve if there is an incident, um, does that cross the line? I mean, at what point do we start to move, you know, because if that's successful, then we put a bunch of them up and, uh, you know, then we look further. And at what point do we begin to uh, impact people's choices to exist in the space. Um, so I don't know. It's uh, um, because that's something that, uh, you know, some people, you know, talking about their experience in London say, yeah, you know, okay, you get used to them and you kind of forget that they're there, but other people say, well, you know, I just avoid this area because, you know, I don't want to be there. Um, so how do we, you know, how do we impact people's lives by our choice of this? Um, but again, you know, just to, just to say it one more time, I, I, I think putting some cameras up that are retrieved after the fact is probably a good, uh, you know, good step at this point. Jim? <clears throat> well, I kind of see cameras as a multiplier for the police force. Um, but it's almost like putting an officer wherever that camera is. And that can be 24/7, which which I think helps. Um, yes, granted, we can't put them all over town, but I think there there are hot spots, and you know, basically downtown, when you see the level of just the, the reports that we get on day-to-day policing, which don't include all the behavioral uh, issues, um, it's pretty pretty heavily concentrated downtown. So I think, I mean, to me, that's a, a pretty good place to start. And if nothing else, it's the perception. Of even if that camera isn't working, having a camera there, even as if, if it's a placebo and it's just sitting there, um, that perception that that camera is working, just that alone is like parking the police car in a neighborhood. They think that there's an officer there. That will itself, to me, will would reduce crime. Um, and even as you know, there's the issue of privacy. I'm not sure how much of us really think there is much privacy once you get outside your home. Any ex expectation of privacy, you're out in the public. We all have phones that can take pictures at any time and video and pretty pretty clear video of whatever you want. I'm not, so I'm not sure really what kind of expectation of privacy there is once you leave your house. Um, and I know the issue was you know, brought up about what happens when crime drops in an area, you know, moving that camera. 
Well, I, if the, that means that camera's worked and done a pretty good job of keeping the crime down there. You take that camera away, I think that crime's going to come right back again. So I, um, I would, my recommendation would be not to take something down if it's working mm -hmm. and working well. Yeah. But um, those are kind of my comments, just food for thought anyway. Okay, I had Tamron and then Jesse. Q. Okay. Well, Tamara's got a question. I have a question. So, so I guess for me, I agree with what Jim said about um, technology. I, you know, I hear what people are saying about privacy, but they're public streets. People can watch you walk down the street. Like Jim said, everybody's got a smartphone with a pretty good camera, video recording capability in their hand at all times, and they do record things. So if you don't want to be recorded, I guess, I guess I'd say don't go out on the public streets because that's what people are doing. I mean, all you have to do is watch YouTube to see <laughs> everything's being recorded by <coughs> kids, by anyone who's there. Um, the thing I wanted to ask was, so I kind of envisioned this um, video, the recorded footage being used in a similar way to ICV and um, body-worn cameras. And my question would be, you know, for people who think that somebody's going to sit there and watch every minute of every... Um, of all of the footage that's recorded, is that what happens with body-worn camera recorded footage in ICV, or is it only viewed when there's a charge, an allegation of misconduct, a complaint filed, um, you know, a, a, a crime reported in that area? Yeah, in practice, that's essentially how in car video is used. Uh, the policy allows uh, supervisors to spot check video just to check on the performance of officers, but I think most sergeants, Sergeant Long can attest to this, I'm sure, don't have the time to spot check officers' video. Okay, Jesse. As far as the, the privacy, it would be perfectly legal for somebody to stand in the middle of the street and watch the front of my house, and they'd be able to see when I go in and out of the garage what I do in the front yard. I don't expect that, and I don't think that the cameras are going to be pointed like that now, but who knows what the conversation is going to be 20 years from now. I do see this as a slippery slope issue. Um, and as, with a detailed, high-resolution enough camera, getting facial recognition technology into it and license plate reading technology into it, it's just a matter of installing a couple of apps into the software between it and the between the camera and the computer. We've got several names in here of, of people the police are interested in the in in the crime report. Um, facial recognition, they can say, oh, we know a person acts just walked over here and you can just kind of keep track. We're just watching that person. You're watching people and you can track more and more of it. Um, I would like to ensure that there's no facial recognition, no license plate reading technology getting installed into these things. This is, you know, this dovetails right in with our conversation about emerging technology too. So I think you raised a lot of points in there that I didn't even think about it. Adding uh, parts into the computer that it can do multi multitask and do so many more things that, um, that I hadn't thought about. So we, we need a motion to, uh, support the chief's request that we get involved in a study. Uh, I think the chief uh, pilot, pilot project. project. Do we need a motion for that? Would the commission like a motion on the table? I think it would be good. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion right. that we uh, approve uh, Pete Kern or Chief Kern's uh, uh, for the police commission to get involved in a pilot project of uh, video or CT. CCTV? CCTV, yes, thank you. Okay, so second. the motion is made. Do we have a second? I just seconded. Tamara just seconded it. Okay, we have a motion and a second and discussion. James. Okay, so the uh, the pilot program is going to be uh, in the, uh, the hot spot area, or the, the one that has the most activity. Is, is that the design of it right now to see how it actually works? And if, if that's the case, then I would, uh, I, I definitely will support this. Uh, because I would be interested in what the, the, uh, the effects are. Uh, I would also say that if it has the, the water balloon effect, uh, 
that it has the ability to, even though you can lead a camera up there as as uh, as was mentioned earlier, as like a placebo, doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that it's activated uh, because you do an installation at another area where the the um, ill intent or ill will people have now migrated to conduct in uh, criminal activity. So it can be set up and cut off as needed. For example, if the area that we're going to be penetrating for the study find out that there is success in that and the activity, the criminal activity moved to another, the camera itself I, I don't think would have to be removed, but it can be turned off and turned on in a different location uh, so that you don't have to go back and forth you know, with the maintenance of moving cameras around. Uh, so I would ask that that would be considered as part of the, uh, but the intent of the study is just to test the thing out, check the, the technology out. So yeah, I would support that. Um, I like the chief's suggestion that we start with the um, articles or information about the pros and cons of CCTV uh, discussion and about, re and then a re looking for a recommendation about the commission from the commission about whether. Um, they're good for Eugene or not, and then go from there. I mean, I thought I envisioned it going a little slower than just jumping right into uh, putting the camera up, and I don't think that was the chief's intent either. But I can't speak for the chief. Just what I heard. Jesse, you know? yeah, I don't understand the implications of the motion. I'm supportive of continuing this conversation. I'm not supportive of calling it a moving toward a pilot project. Okay, thank you. Um, but you're clear that is what the motion is. I'm not. I don't understand okay, the motion. Okay, you want to restate your motion then so we can? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to support Chief Kern's uh, idea of a pilot project in uh, the closed circuit television uh, to start the study of uh, what that involves and the impact on, I guess, our society, yeah. Okay, do, do we understand? Help me with this. <coughs> all right, go ahead. I just want to clarify that really all I was, uh, what I was proposing is that we first, uh, we gather the studies that, uh, and we learn what uh, the world has discovered about closed circuit TV systems uh, mm -hmm. for public safety, and, uh, and then that would fall, what would follow would be a discussion, and uh, whether, uh, what the police commission thought about the efficacy of a pilot project after that. But right now it doesn't feel as though, even I don't feel as though I know enough about this other than to know that uh, CCTV cameras have created more safety and help solve crimes in other communities. Okay, so uh, the motion, as I understand it, is that we support the chief in his efforts to have a policy, look into a pilot project. Pilot project. Okay, so we are not actually forming a pilot project ourselves, so we'll make that clear. So the effort is to support the chief in his efforts to correct to make uh, form a pilot project to look into CCTV. Now, is that the way the second who Tamara you second? Yeah, I second it. Do you do you understand it to be that way? So your second stands? I, I think that what what, what uh, the motion is saying and what we're supporting is exploration of the technology not implementation of a pilot project. Does this seem better to you, more palatable to, you, to you amend the motion friendly-wise? Yeah, yes. Okay, so you want to go ahead and do that, state that again. We're going to be... Exploration of CCTV technology. Okay. So the motion is for the commission to look into exploration of CCTV policy. Technology. Technology. Technology, I'm sorry, not policy. Technology. Okay. Tech. By extension, the policy, I guess, when we got that before us, too, but that's a separate issue. I understand what you're saying. The so. idea of moving towards a pilot project. Okay, let's now. But we, I'm not going to say we're that. We're adding you, stuff in here now. It, it might yeah. be better if Carter reads back the actual one. I have rather about than 500 <laughs> versions, so <laughs> paraphrase I'm in the back. Give me. We're struggling, but we're, we're so struggling. Okay. What, what, just you, what I understand the chief to be asking, and where I think the consensus could be reached, is to add an agenda item because it's not currently in your work plan. So all I think you need to do is to add 
agenda time in the future to continue the discussion on CTCTV and that the department will bring back studies, uh, pros and cons, and engage with the commission on a discussion about the efficacy of it in Eugene. That's exactly what I meant to say. <laughs> so if you can put that in writing, we have a yeah. second still? Yes. And any further discussion on that, that motion? motion? Since that's changed a little bit from what it was. Yes, uh, what Jesse it, and Joe. I want to hear what ends up being I, in writing. Give me a second. I will. <laughs> you all can talk. <laughs> really? We can't just stare at you, Carter? Yeah. Let me take care of the procedural <laughs> after I write out your motion. <laughs> yeah, this, this has gotten a lot milder since uh, I, I guess it first got stated, or at least as I, as <laughs> I interpret it. Um, yeah, as it, as it initially went out, I kind of had the sense that we were looking um, to actually get involved in an implementation. Um, and that there was, you know, initially the support to do that. But I think, you know, we're now down to more of a study, which I think is probably a better place to be at this point. Um, and really, you know, is it, is it economic? Is it efficacious? Um, what are the issues? And so I'm much happier with that. Okay. James. Yeah, well, there's a lot of interpretation going around as the intent. I understand it better as quite a phrase it, but, um, you know, I was under the impression that it would actually be a physical study uh, where the, a system was put in, in addition to the additional research uh, that's applicable, that's been used in use in other areas. So I assume that I was uh, not correct in my assumption, but I, I'm okay with with moving forward. Uh, one of the things is that uh, if the crime is up there, is, is there an urgency need for this uh, particular technology is one of the things. And if I would say that the argument would be that if crime is to a point where it is out of control, then that would certainly indicate an urgency uh, to kind of uh, put something, some, implement something that's going to uh, reverse the trend of crime in the area. If it's the crime statistics and, and results and stuff is not urgent, then I can say that, well, we can sit back and we can review all kind of studies. I'm good at that. That's all I've been doing for the last couple of years is researching in different studies and stuff. And I can tell you, you can study 10, 12 years and stuff and still not come up with anything because everybody adds on to the study. It continues to build. That's why they, can talk, they call it a study. Everybody wants to study. So, what is, is there an urgency for this technology? And if there is an urgency for this technology based on crime, actual data, stuff that's happening, stuff, what would be the, the harm in having a pilot, a physical pilot program uh, test run? Uh, and it's only going to be that, a test run to find out, does this thing really work? Does, is this thing really good for Eugene? Uh, because we can carry on the conversation for years and never come up with a conclusion. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you, James, for stating that. I think that the community, because the what I've heard is fear and apprehension in the community about this um, technology and cameras being put up, I think that um, just putting up a camera without doing some research on the technology first and having discussion about it, maybe even discussion with the community about it, would be alarming to some people. I know when uh, Councillor Sorette was at the table and, and she came in late to the meeting and, and heard that there could be cameras put up, she was visibly alarmed. I mean, she was very concerned. So I, I hear what you're saying about and, I, and, and that may be where we end up is putting up a camera for a pilot, but I think that um, looking at it a little more in depth and, and taking our time on it up front is what would make it more um, palatable to the community and um, have an education component if that is what we were gonna do. And having us decide whether that is something that, you know, we <coughs> want in Eugene before we put up, put up the camera. Anybody else before James goes again? Jesse? Real quickly, um, I want to apologize because I was the one who said last month that 
I, I misunderstood something that the chief had said previously that cameras were coming or, or something like that. I don't know what I misunderstood, and I restated that, and I was wrong about that. You're it's definitely not where we're at right now. So. Yeah, well, and my thinking on this is a ball. You know, so I've learned more about the sensitivities than the community. About. So, Jane. Yeah, real quick, yeah, just to add on that, and I do agree with that. It is, it is an approach. I, I'm not suggesting that all of a sudden the uh, department go up and throw up cameras right now. You know, that's a process. You have to have some kind of research in order to prepare uh, uh, the community to say that this is coming or this is being considered. So, yeah, it, it would take a process, and I don't know. It may even be, what, six months, maybe even a year. I don't know how long it would take for that, but it is a process. Uh, but based on the urgency, uh, we want to at least – Get something started moving forward. That, that's my. That's where I was going with that. Okay, Carter, do you want to restate <clears throat> that uh, how you've got it, the issue about making it part of our work plan? Uh, my thinking is evolved. <laughs> I like that. What I have that's is a, that's a handy. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a that's, uh, I move that the commission continue discussion about the benefits and impacts of a CCTV system and whether the use of CCTV would be useful in Eugene. I think okay. that's all you need. The motion is to continue discussion. Yeah. We have a second for that. Yes. Okay, we're sticking with the second. All right. Oil. Who, who, I don't get to make we the motion. Have any more? I, I no. made that motion. George, is to make sure that is My thinking also has evolved. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's what was <laughs> asked. That you, Quick evolution. That you worded for. So <laughs> yeah. George accepted it. Tamara continued to second it, just for the record. And any more discussion now that we've heard the actual final draft, I think, of this motion? Any further discussion on it? If it pleases the commission, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Fine. We're carried. The motion carries. And we're moving on to the next topic, which is uh, the constitutional privacy from the proverbial frying pan. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just, if I could, the reason this is on is because as of last month's meeting, you hadn't um, narrowed down what you wanted to talk about or how you wanted to talk about it. So what you have in the packet is the comments that you made at the last meeting um, summarized. And uh, one of the things I would just want to point out is that continuing to talk about CCTV, in fact, could be a discussion about constitutional privacy. So you could say mm -hmm. we've done that and that that is what we want to focus that conversation on. Or there was a whole list of other things that were that came up at the last meeting that are also included in the packet, um, and the CCTV got slipped in because of the department's interest in getting your input. So the first question is, do you want to do that in addition to another conversation about something else having to do with constitutional privacy, or is that the conversation that you want to have? So just wanted to offer that. And uh, in fact, the last page of your packet, if you, you know, follow along here. It, it does number five, educate the community about closed circuit TV in downtown. That was so one of, one of the agenda items that we had brought up. And there are others there. Perhaps uh, the people who brought those up feel they still want to continue to discuss that. Um, I would like the commission to help formulate what, what you want to do with this at this stage. So please let me know. Jim. I think our dis nothing came out. That's good. Um, I think our discussion, as we get more and more into CCTV, will probably uncover a lot of constitutional issues, and we'll probably have a lot of discussion about that. And we'll probably get a lot of input from the, from the public on that too. So I could see that that would could probably resolve a lot of our questions that we have. But I, Thank you. But I also wouldn't mind having a little having somebody come and present a little bit on constitutional privacy or con just constitutional, you know, I guess it is constitutional privacy and how it affects policing, just to have a better idea of that too, maybe even before we get into the, the CCTV discussion, or at least sometime during it to have those issues brought up. Okay, Tamara. I, I um, read through these comments, a lot of the comments that we made last time were about technology, not just CCTV, but no. some of them were about CCTV. Um, 
I do think that CCTV is a good place to start exploring that, seeing what it's about, seeing what the pros and cons are. I, I don't think that we necessarily need to say it's going to end there, though. And there may be other things after we get done with that that we want to do in the constitutional privacy arena. And I, and I, so I, I'd like to leave it. Start say let's start with CCTV and leave it open ended. We might do um, something after that, or like um, uh, Carter or Bob suggested. You know, things might issues might come up as we're looking at that that we want to you know put in the parking lot for working on after we're done with CCTV in the Constitutional Privacy Arena. Okay, that seems to be a, a good response to that. It does, it, I'm looking at a lot of these points we brought up, and you can almost apply them, every one of these questions to work CCTV and vice versa. You could say, does CCTV impact this question? And in some, most cases it does. So I think we'll be making our study more about a broader issue here than just one about putting cameras on that town. So anybody have anything else they'd like to add to this, Jesse? The policy that was presented about, <coughs> I remember the name of it, but we didn't vote on that, did we? Is it going to come? Technology. Yeah, emerging technology. Um, where is that in the process? Does it, is it going to come back before the commission? Do you want the commission to look at it again? Well, I, well let me just respond on. to that. I asked uh, Matt to help me develop an interim policy. I like the work you did so much that I played around with it and asked Matt to develop an interim policy. But what we should do is bring back exactly what where you left it uh, so that you can continue the work on what you've already done. Is that fair, Matt? Oh, yes, sir. We had some recommendations, I believe, from the commission that you were going to yeah, incorporate into the... They're reflected in the one that's... You know the chief can review at any time, but if you'd like for next month to bring that, yeah, let's bring that back up to the commission we'll so they can review it. It dovetails right into this with mm -hmm. the whole idea of technology and constitutional issues are all involved here when we talk about every, you know every bit of it. License plate readers, drones. You know, I mean, uh, while we're having this conversation, I'm thinking you know the police can do put up a camera anywhere right now. It's public. There is no. I mean. It's just like putting a police officer standing on a corner. Somebody mentioned, you know, that using the use of technology, putting a, a police officer and paying him whatever they make per hour now, I'm not sure. They they stand there for 24 hours and, and watch a location. Or you can put a camera up there for a whole lot less. And if it's in the public and it's not looking into places that are protected constitutionally, perfectly legal. So the police can do that now anyway. They don't need anybody's permission to do that. They just they can do it. So, uh, so what we're going to get to is the meat of it. Where, where, where's that line that we're crossing, and what, what is it that we want to see people feel about this in the community? How do they, how do they accept um, this kind of thing? London was mentioned. I think that you know, people um, in that city uh, do they feel safer? That's the kinds of questions I have. I don't know. George, I have a question for, uh, for Pete. Is there any? Do the police have any cameras now other than around, I think you may have some around the police station, but outside of the police station, do you monitor anyone? We have, a, um, we have a, for a certain investigations, we have hidden cameras <laughs> that we put on specific locations where we're investigating somebody for a certain crime. Okay, but there's no fixed camera? There is no CCTV camera system. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that the police department has. There's, a, I think, a couple of parks have uh, CCTV cameras yeah, the, that you can access on. The, the Rose Garden has one that you can actually pan and tilt and zoom in and zoom out. Mm -hmm. You can go online and do so that. You just use theirs online for right Yeah. Mm. Actually, I haven't been on it for <laughs> two or Public three years. Public Works used to that. have one at the, uh, I forget which butte it is, but it's the one way south on the Butte. Yeah, Spencer's Butte, the one south on, on Willamette. They used to have one that covered the parking lot. Funding and I think um, technology bypassed them, so that, that went away. I'm just warning you, if you go to River Bend, they're all over the place. So. <laughs> if you go to Eurasian, they're all over the place. There's an auto house. But have I ever looked at one other than the guy next door at the Toyota had it stolen that he left his keys in it? I think Bill and I probably have a few. In All right, we're we're in the field. Let's get back to <laughs> right. uh, get back to this. We we will continue without objection 
and with unanimous consent, we will continue this item on the agenda along with the CCTV that we approve, the motion we approve for that. No objection? That's fine. We'll move on. Carter will add that to the next one. All right, we're down to the update on the police commission vacancy, and Carter has some news for us here. I think we've got my Steve Sergeant Brown. Certainly. Thank you. Bless you. Pleasure. Stay. Thank welcome. you. Thank you, Sergeant. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. All right, take care. There's cookies over there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it. some. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh. They're coming. Yeah, they're just Everybody get one? The Wanda, you want one? Did you get one? Yeah. Did you want one? <laughs> okay. So uh, after the nomination period was reopened we received five additional applications for the position vacated with the resignation of Juan Carlos uh, if the Commission wants to review the applications and make comments for the mayor's consideration you could create a committee to review the applications and meet with the applicants committee members should be identified at a Commission meeting and the commission should confirm, it would be helpful if the commission confirmed what you want the committee to ask, because otherwise the committee calls me and asks me, and it's actually, that's why I don't. No, you don't. <laughs> it's one of the things that you all get to decide. So what you have here is brief information about the five applicants, or six applicants, um, and the questions that were asked last year. And at the bottom, what, what ended up going to the mayor was the uh, list of each um, reviewer's scores for each candidate, but not um, anonymously. So reviewer one, reviewer two, or whatever. Um, an average score and then overall assessment by each reviewer. And if, if uh, the general consensus was highly recommend and also came forward with whatever summary we could make based on the uh, majority of the reviewers. So that's what went last time. That's who you've got to be reviewing. And um, at this point, I think we're just looking for uh, if you want to have, the, and the mayor is holding up her recommendations until they hear from the commission. Okay. Nice. Sounds good. So we are we are at a point now where uh, what I'd like to do is appoint a committee to interview the, uh, the applicants, and I would like Tamara to chair that committee, and I would ask for volunteers to work with it. George, Jesse, Joe. That's four. We need one more, I think. No, you're Five. Good. Four's so good. You're good with four. <laughs> Usually have three. Good if tie Four's vote. good. If you have a tie vote, then there's no vote. 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 We. Tally. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. They are. Uh, yeah. James, I'd like to include you, though, if you're in if you're Oh, yeah. That's fine. You're okay? Volunteer. All right. That's fine. Okay. Well, so the committee consists of... I didn't know James did. Recently. Tamara as chair. <laughs> Joe. Everybody's name starts with a J. Jesse and George. J. That's George that volunteer. George with a J, yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> but actually, if you'd like to... You know, sit in, there's no harm. So, would yeah. you like to? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll stop right now. And James. He fits because he's a J. So, we have uh, <laughs> Joe, Jesse, James, and George, Jorge. Okay. <laughs> Got the four J's. Yeah. Okay. And Wait, Cameron. if any of their names start with J, is James on the committee? Yes. Okay. Um, so, those are, the, those are the volunteers, and that's the committee. I'll take a motion to approve the committee that will review the applicants. I have a motion for that. So moved. By second. Man, seconded by Bill. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed. Okay, we have a duly constituted committee to interview the candidates. Chip, a question for Carter. What is A forward slash PI? Asian Pacific Islander. Okay, so I asked that question that's, too. Right? I, th that, I thought that's what it was. That, yeah. and <clears throat> do, okay. do we need a second motion ooh, ooh. to give them? The ability to create their own questions. If you want, if you're good with these questions, you can say go with these questions. Well, or you I, I would, I would tell you that's the reason I picked Tamara because she's done this many right. times, and so 
I know she knows uh, those questions. If you're not comfortable and you'd like to add questions, feel free to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's a suggestion, these are the these are typical questions that we've asked in the past. If there's something you want to get at that isn't captured in the questions here, um, you know, please say so. I'll leave that to you, the committee. The committee. Yeah. Okay. One more question. Sorry. Do you? Um, these are public meetings because it is a public, consti publicly constituted committee of the commission. Um, and do you want, and, and the scores are, whatever you write down is public. Um, do you want your information to come back to the commission or does it go right from the committee to the mayor? The, and the only reason it matters is because it will delay if you, we have to wait until the next commission meeting before the recommendations go on to the council, to the mayor. Don't care, just would be good to know. Seems like it's gone to the mayor in the past. Yeah. It has, yeah. but and, and, I just and, didn't want anyone to be surprised. Yeah, and, and since it's individual recommendations, it's not gonna change whether the committee reviews it, or the commission reviews it again anyway. They could. And they're just recommendations to the mayor. It's ultimately up to yeah. the mayor makes a recommendation to the city council. The city council mm -hmm. has the power to appoint. They don't have to look at right. any her recommendation or ours. Right. And that has happened. So I'm sensing so the commission is okay that, with letting yeah. the committee we, take we care of its work. Don't recommend on someone she appoints. Not needing the, not needing the approval of the commission uh, over the selections. Okay. I'm sensing that. Do I need a motion for that, or is that something? Okay. okay. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna let that leave that up to the committee. Okay. Yeah, that's not what I mean. Joe, I, I did have. Uh, who was the person who applied during the first? The last person. The last person is was the one who applied first. Yes. Okay. Um, have any of these things been scheduled or for the? No, we had to we form had to the, form committee the committee first. first so. Okay. And it won't be next week. Well, we have other things next week. Oh, of course, like, two know. nights we have uh, two, two things next week. Plus, plus there's the meeting yeah, notification the requirements. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would expect that you all would get together and try to find yeah. a date by email. And yeah. once you find a date that's acceptable, everybody will publish it. Could, could we take a couple minutes and see if we can nail one down and that will make the process go a good yeah, deal faster? Yeah, right after for just a minute. Why? You know, sur what is it, Survey Monkey, whatever, whatever those are, oh, yeah. does such a fine job with that. But I don't yeah. Could you help us with what I don't you know how to run a survey? I'm not involved. So. Yeah, you are. You Carter's going to help us with Survey Monkey. Thank you, Carter. Thank you. Monkey. All right. Thank you. Okay, so this will get Schedule out. Monkey. Uh, Carter, I know, I know uh, mm -hmm. Carter will, will stay on top of this, and I know Tamara will. We'll do a usually great job and get it out to you right away, so we'll, we'll get this done. Okay. Okay, um, the last item on the agenda, we we'll to that, and that's com comments, I believe, commission comments. Yes, and so, um, going around, uh, I guess I'll start out by thanking you all tonight. I, I realize uh, it was a sacrifice for some folks to get here, so thank you. I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that you did come in. Um, after obviously having other conflicts. So thank you because we may not have had a quorum and voted on anything tonight if you hadn't showed up. So it's always important to make the effort. So thank you. Uh, and thank you for the hard work here we're doing. It's a, this is not easy work. It's going to require a, a lot of uh, understanding and cooperation. And I appreciate the, the, the thoughtfulness that you all are putting into our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So I'm going around, any other comments by commissioners here tonight? Okay. Um, I, I don't know what's what's happened to the commission, but it sure seems like we're a, a friendlier, softer, getting along better commission. I don't know. It's, I, I know when I when I first started, there was there seemed to be a lot of uh, back and forth and a lot more arguing, and um, and it seems to have mellowed out a lot more. And it seems like we were able to get even more done and push things through a lot faster and, and get things get things moving as as we're and I don't know what it is. I don't know if we're just, um, we're not, and we're definitely not all agreeing, but the conversation seems to be a little more, a little more calm and um, a lot, a little more on the compromising side so we can all kind of come up with a really good solution that, you know, maybe we don't always agree that it's, you know, what we were really looking forward to, 
or what we really wanted, but it, it's a, a good compromise that we all, for the most part, I think, seem to to like. So just like the way we're headed. And thank you, everybody. Okay. Well, well since, uh, you know, again, I, I appreciate the flexibility of the commission and stuff, and uh, uh, Chair and Vice Chair, thank you so much. Uh, just kind of give you a little update uh, as to what I have been going on <clears throat> going on with me. Uh, the week of the uh, 23rd of September, uh, I attended a conference in the D.C. area. Uh, at the conference, I was uh, a part of a national coalition uh, advocacy group uh, that were looking to kind of uh, advocate for some some basic principles and stuff, in, in particular around uh, law enforcement. One of the conversations that I injected into the uh, meeting, we had uh, we had the ear of the uh, uh, the assistant to the president, uh, and he's the uh, assistant to the president, and he's the cabinet secretary, and also one of the legislative directors uh, that's affiliated with the um, justice department. Is uh, in view of all of the things that are going on back east. Uh, with uh, St. Louis, Ferguson, and all those uh, police departments, I reflected back on my own experience as a police officer. And what I went through uh, my time on the uh, department that I served on and stuff in the process. And there was one thing that jumped out at me at, that I wanted to get a national conversation started. And it's also starting here in uh, at some legislation that's going to be coming down here in, in the state of Oregon as well. And that is to have mandatory psychological evaluation of all police applicants. In addition to that, uh, we are also pushing for annual uh, psychological evaluations of, uh, of active uh, police officers. Based on the fact is that we are all human and we go through different experiences. We have watershed moments and stuff. We have deaths in the family. We have debt and everything else. And sometimes we take those things to work with us. I know that's true for my experience in the, uh, the military as well. And I think that it's, it's a healthy thing to do because what we've getting away from is that there's a conversation that's going out about the bad guy. My experience in the military, when we refer to the bad guy, we refer to the enemy. That's military jargon, the bad guy. And I hear it so much in a lot of uh, back east, uh, St. Louis and Chicago and the police department and stuff, and they're going around setting up the bad guy. The police department started off, the police work started off to be peace officers. And we gradually move uh, from peace officers to uh, policemen. And then all of a sudden, we're starting to categorize people uh, subconsciously or uh, whatever our experiences are. And it has evolved to a place that uh, we are in, uh, we're, we're in a hell of a situation. And in spite of all the number of thousands of good police officers, there is a chance and there is evident that there, we get some bad police officers that go into the system and stuff. And uh, some of them are, uh, have, have done some things that I know that uh, uh, some things that I've seen some officers do, not here, uh, that are reprehensive. So how do we get the best quality people, the people that's going there for good intentions, the people that's going in to protect and serve? I think it would be another measure uh, that uh, conversation that I've started nationally and then we've also got started here uh, statewide as well. Uh, again, this has nothing to do with Eugene Ple EPD. I think, I think we have an excellent chief. Uh, I'm confident in, in the direction that he's going. He's doing things great. And I know we got a bunch of great officers. I've had a lot of interactions with officers here. But nationally, it's a problem. So uh, that's what I've been up to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I had Tamara and uh, anybody else? And George. OK. So I really, um, I, I echo the um, comments that have been made by Bob and Jim. You guys weren't on the commission before, so you don't really realize um, that not being willing to have a calm, respectful conversation can slow down the work that's accomplished by this group. Um, I'm just going to say, in case you haven't heard me say it before, second revision of the taser policy, 11 months. I mean, if you could imagine how that could be possible. 
um, when people are working together. It's, it's So this group, I just have to commend you, getting so much work done, such good discussion. Uh, people are respectful of other people's opinions even when they disagree, and I really appreciate that. Um, I like that we're talking about emerging technologies right after our commission meeting last month. Um, there were two television shows that we regularly watch um, that had drones on them that were, you know, and one, it was kind of like scary. I just, something I never envisioned when we were talking about it was, you know, they, in the, the scenario was they'd hijack this military drone that had guns on it and were terrorizing people on the beach and shooting people at random. And I thought, in one way, that's sort of a far out scenario, but in the other, on the other hand, I mean, how hard would it be that technology's cheap it's easy to get a hold of and how hard would it be to retrofit it with a weapon and so you kind of have to think about those things and say gosh you know in that case we'd be looking at the police department we're talking about drones we've talked about the police having drones but you have to also think about how would the police protect us if something like that was going on when we talk about some of those technologies it's important to look at both sides and I don't you know I'm not saying I think that would necessarily happen but there was a it was interesting to me that it's it's definitely at the forefront of um, you know uh, the public uh, awareness and and uh, people are acquiring more of them every day so I'm glad that we're talking about that and I'm glad that we're continuing that discussion thanks Thank you. and and Jim and all of you I mean I, I I really enjoy each and every one of you all bring a different perspective you know like Joe and Jesse were you know, like you over there a little more now, you're a little over there. Oh, no, maybe I'm over there. I don't know what it is. But I really, really, really appreciate you guys' input because I've just learned a heck of a lot of things that I didn't consider before. And it's just been really, really an enlightening in, in all kinds of aspects. And, yeah, what a great group to uh, work with. And, I just, and, and, Bob, thank you very kindly for your calm way to handle the different things and... Joe for you to bring in the the person who obviously wanted to say something so I, I really appreciate the sensitivity and of course there's uh, Chief Kearns I really appreciate the way you handle things I've learned a lot from, a whole bunch from a different style that I really really appreciate and, and I think we are doing really really great work and I also am really excited about moving into this new area of closed circuit TV and the reason being is I'm a, I'm a real believer I'm a gadget guy first of all I love gadgets but I really really think they're they're incredible tools to be able to have cost efficient uh, effective ways of having a safer society and and you know more or less you know working and getting and, and, and I didn't really believe in bad guys until I started getting involved with the police things there are I think there's some really bad people out there and I didn't you know my I just kind of shielded myself from them and didn't believe it but now I really know that they're there so I applaud moving ahead keeping ahead a little bit of the curve of uh, technology so thank you thank you George anybody else got anything right yep I will and I was not gonna say anything um, I went to that ACLU um, event I will call it uh, on the civil conversation um, and I want to say um, the chief did an excellent job um, in handling that because I thought that was an unfair process um, it also made I felt the Commission look like they didn't do a good job is what the presenters sort of said at that and it was hard for me to sit there and not say anything and listen to them that we didn't do enough work on putting together that policy on professional stops so um, I, I got to hand it to the chief he's does it better he, he did really well in handling that situation and also even talking about it tonight um, because uh, it didn't I didn't think that was a, a very fair uh, work that they did Thank you. Yep. I guess my turn uh, yeah I wasn't really gonna say much but there's been a lot of comments that uh, have raised raised some issues um, I guess on that on that policy, I thought all in all that we did a pretty good job on that on that policy, um, and I was I was surprised um, by the response of a couple couple of people that you know, I mean regarding it, but um, yeah, I mean we've got 
we've got a, you know, in, in my opinion, I think we have a, a police force here that's, you know, and I've said this before, um, while we're not perfect, I, I actually have seen in the two years that I've been here some movements, some changes that, um, that I think are good. I mean, some of it came out of um, the experience with the interactions with the whole Occupy thing. And uh, I think the, the police department uh, um, grew very nicely from, from some of those things. And, um, and you know, it, it sort of gives you the feeling like there's hope, um, you know, that, that things are, are going really well. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that, that did make a difference was adopting, I guess, at the, a year and a half ago when we had the um, retreat, adopting a, a sort of flexible concept where we could, you know, choose what our agenda was as opposed to having it uh, locked down, you know, a great deal of distance in the, in the future. So it's, it's allowed for some flexibility and some response to uh, issues as they come up. So I think all in all, uh, I'm very pleased with the direction that, um, that I see both with the commission and um, with the department. I have an enormous amount of respect for uh, Chief Kearns. And the more I interact with them, the more I get to like them even more. Um, so I'll leave it at that and see you guys next month. Thank you, Joe. Don't let it go to your head. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just wanted that, to remind uh, me that it shouldn't. On that conciliatory note, we're adjourned. Thank you. Please pass your names okay. forward. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 I want to take, take one bad thing out of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I could have had a baby in the type of this for the game. Oh, uh, Jesse? Um, the stuff that I came across was basically surfing YouTube. That's what I was wondering. Just and, and, the, and the reality is, you know, I can, I can try to see if I can find some of that stuff again, but the reality is. I can't. It's just I don't want to. I may never stumble across it again. I know what you mean. Yeah.